thank you. But welcome again. I'm Christy Fouché. We are so excited to host you all for the IG today. We have a really great agenda lined up talking about really important issues pressing in the built environment. Um, our, our OBO leadership and our industry advisory group are, um, are ready to get engaged. Um, I wanted to uh, give you guys a few, um, a few little tips um, for information. We are using WebEx event. So if you're joining us and you're not a panelist, um, the, um, the, the, your mic is muted and your video is off to uh, ensure the integrity of the presentation for everyone. Um, uh, but the chat function is being monitored. So if you're having any issues um, or need some attention, you can just um, chat us and the folks that are moderating it will definitely try to troubleshoot for you. We've got some information. Um, we've got some information on the uh, like kind of welcome screen here. If you, if you have any problems, you can do a screenshot of it. Um, all of our all of our materials for the event um, are posted on the web link included here. We are also using Slido for questions. Um, we hope to have a lively discussion with you. So Slido is the best option for us to be able to um, interact and, and get a lot of questions going. So please, uh, the QR code here or there's a link in the chat function to Slido as well. Um, if you if you tee that up, you'll be you'll be set to ask us questions um, or make comments. Please do that throughout the session. We do have dedicated times for Q&A, um, but, um, but we are hoping to be able to get all those teed up. So as you have questions, just go ahead and plug them in. Um, we are um, we are again in a WebEx event situation that is being recorded. Um, so this will be posted along with all of the materials later today um, on on our website. Um, and uh, there was there was a joke. Sorry, I was trying to turn my volume down. I do that a lot, not just on virtual meetings. <laughs> Oh, I have to do it manually, and, I, and I'm not even doing it right. So sorry if I'm so loud. Um, but uh, uh, when when we were talking about how to open um, with technical issues, we also figured out a way to turn everybody's video on at the same time. So, um, it, but we're not going to enable that. But what we can, we can turn your mics on and we can turn your video on. Um, the only other comment I, I will make is that um, as we get into the Q and A, um, if you do want to raise your hand or make a comment, um, that function is right by your name on the panelist link, you can just enable raise your hand um, and we'll be able to call on you on that time. Okay. All right, so Henry, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started. Okay, Christy, thank you very much. Hopefully my microphone's okay for everybody out there. Um, again, you know, uh, welcome to our IAG members, our uh, panelists, uh, OBO leadership, and the many participants who are, I see, you know, rolling in very quickly. So it's exciting to see uh, significant numbers of folks uh, coming to this event virtually. Um, before we started, though, we did want to do our introductions and, and go ahead and have the um, IAG members, OBO leadership, our academic advisors and speakers introduce themselves briefly. Uh, to facilitate that, we will have uh, a slide with the names highlighted uh, for each of the individuals to, to, at that time to go ahead and introduce themselves briefly, and then it'll highlight the next name in sequence. So it should, it should do it iteratively, and hopefully everybody will have an opportunity just to quickly introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their work, and um, and everybody will have a chance to uh, see who, who's going to be our panelists today. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and move into the introductions very quickly. It looks like we have uh, Dr. Anderson who will kick us off. Some individuals may have issues with the microphones. Uh, Yeah, I think we'll just go, we can go right down to Christian next. Okay, great. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Christian Bailey with ODA in New York City. We've got Sandra. Yes, uh... Oops, I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, this is Sandy Brock with Mitch Engineering uh, here out of Boston. Okay. And Christopher, uh, not sure if he's muted. Okay, I guess we'll go out to Susanna. Am 
Hi, this is Anne Marie Duval Decker at Duval Decker in Jackson, Mississippi. Hello, this is Maureen Ehrenberg. I'm with Blue Skyer out of Chicago. Hi, this is Bryant Farland uh, with Skanska. Good morning, Christina Hudson calling from Washington, D.C., uh, climate adaptation and resilience uh, specialty. Hello, this is Nico Kinsel from Akoya 10, sustainability consultants. Good morning, this is Carol Ann again with Clark Construction here in Bethesda, Maryland. Good morning, this is Deborah Langman Smith uh, with LSM Studios in Washington, D.C. and New York. Good morning, this is Katie McGimsey with Affiliated Engineers um, located in Rockville, Maryland. Good morning, it's Jonathan Moody with Moody Nolan. Hi, this is Alan Ragansky. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm with Gray Ragansky Architecture, and I teach at the Yale School of Architecture, and I'm currently the uh, director of the Innovations Lab at the Bauhaus Earth in Potsdam, Germany. I am Frank Siami, Siami Construction. I'm sorry. Um, greetings. This is um, Daryl Rounds from the lovely state of Michigan, representing General Motors. Yeah, hi. This is Dan Cecil uh, from Lyra Structural with uh, offices in New York, Mumbai, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Seoul. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. My name is Stacey Smedley. I'm the executive director of a Seattle based nonprofit called Building Transparency, focused on reducing embodied carbon emissions of construction. Hi, this is Jane Smith. I'm a partner of Space Smith Architects, Interior Designers in New York City and upstate New York. Good morning, this is Greg Starr. I'm a security consultant formerly with Diplomatic Security. Good morning, this is Rob Swedberg with TPS in Atlanta, Georgia. <clears throat> Good morning, this is Jeremiah Watts with D. Watts Construction located in uh, Northern Virginia. Good morning, I'm Marion Weiss, Weiss Van Freddy, Architecture, Landscape, Urbanism in New York City, and Graham Chair, Professor of Practice at the University of Pennsylvania. Good morning, I'm Claire Weiss, um, Architecture and Planning Office in New York and DC. Good morning. I'm Elizabeth Whitaker from Merge Architects out of Boston, also a professor in architecture at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. Good morning. Okay, I'll now ask our uh, leadership team to go ahead and introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. Victoria Hartke, I'm the acting principal deputy director for OBO. Good morning. I am Jeff Reba, OBO's comptroller. Um, that means I'm the bureau's chief financial officer, uh, with responsibility also for our our policy and our relations with with Congress, uh, GAO, and the department's inspector general. Good morning, everybody. My name is Angel Dizon. I'm the managing director for our program development. Uh, that includes project management, special project management, 
cost management and design management. Good morning, I'm Tracy Thomas, Managing Director for Construction Facility Security Management. Our directorate oversees operations and maintenance of the global portfolio valued at $90 billion and also the capital security construction program valued at $10 billion. We're implementing those programs uh, supported by strong data analytics and models for collaboration and risk mitigation. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Adam Lamoureux, the Managing Director for Operations. Our directorate includes six offices, the Office of Fire Protection, Safety, Health, and Environmental Management, the Office of Art and Embassies, and the Office of Cultural Heritage, the Office of Residential Design and Furnishings, and lastly, the Office of Area Management, which plays a coordinating role for OBO, uh, both internally and with our overseas posts. Thank you. Good morning, folks. My name is Gary Seibert. I'm currently acting as the managing director for planning and real estate. When I'm not doing that. My regular job is as, as the director of the Office of Strategic Planning. Good to be here. Okay, and I'll ask our academic advisors to briefly introduce themselves as well. Hi, I'm Mark Robbins. I'm the president of the American Academy in Rome and uh, speaking to you from Rome. Great. I guess my other academic colleagues must be teaching. Um, my name is Kimberly Gray. I'm a professor of environmental engineering and the chair of civil and environmental engineering at Northwestern University. And I'll be talking to you um, about the Embassy 2050 study uh, later on this morning. Thank you. Great, thank you. Kimberly, this is Chris. I wish I was still sleeping. I'm watching the sun come up uh, here in Tempe, Arizona. I'm uh, a professor in the School of Sustainability and the Dean of the College of Global Futures. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, thank you. Well, Chris, I said teaching. I thought I said teaching. Oh, I, I somehow heard sleeping. Sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like our students. Great, um, I'll also ask then our, our speakers for today, uh, speakers to introduce themselves briefly. Hey, good morning. I'm Rick Sullivan. I'm the director of design and engineering here at OBO. Good morning. My name is Curtis Clay. I'm the director of architecture for OBO. I lead a team of 35 architects and landscape architects in the department who are responsible for ensuring the overall architectural representation and the design engineering coordination for all of our facilities abroad meet our rigorous design standards. So uh, I'm Jason Delara. I'm the director of real estate acquisitions and disposals uh, at the State Department. So that's all of our buying and selling of real estate around the world. Uh, and one of those areas uh, that we're going to talk about today is uh, buying sites for our new embassies. And and I also have a nine year old daughter. And luckily she's in school, or she'd probably be on video with me right now. Thank you, Jason. Good morning, my name is Jamie Cook. I'm a partner at Crick and Sexton Partners in Chicago. Great, thank you very much, Jamie. Um, and again, I'm glad we had a chance to introduce everybody. I think that also gave uh, more folks an opportunity to dial in. So I see where our numbers continue to increase. Again, I'm very happy, very privileged to be kicking off this new iteration of our industry advisory group, this annual meeting. Uh, I would like to welcome our new members and also thank our returning members for their continued support to the Department of State and the Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations. I'm very excited about our present IAG as it's the most diverse to date in terms of our skills, backgrounds, and experience. Uh, you all have ex expertise touching across all aspects of the work that OBO does. You know, as they say, it does take a village, and I think we do have a veritable village here of experts to help us with our work. And I think in today's program, We'll have an opportunity to see how we've been fortunate in having such expertise. Uh, initially, we'll have the peer review readout, giving a summary of the range of projects and designs we've initiated over the course of the year, and how those projects have been shaped by the input and feedback from our advisors. Uh, then the discussion will shift to how we're looking more strategically in the longer term nature of our work, uh, approaches to innovation, and understanding how 
we ultimately operate in a broader context, influencing the environment and the community in which we work, uh, which we build and operate our facilities. In addition, we'll be looking at what may be the greatest impact on our future work, climate change. Again, I should note that our efforts on all these fronts have occurred during a very dynamic and challenging period over this past year. I have to thank our IAG members, the entire OBO team for their outstanding efforts during the very dis uh, dramatic disruptions of COVID. And it's a, des a testament, I think, to your, your dedication and pro professionalism that we've been able to accomplish so much in the past year. Um, and I should note also, you know, the significant efforts include um, such, I think, you know, very noteworthy data points that in the course of our work, you know, we were successful in vaccinating over 90% of our workers overseas, about 13,000 workers working on various projects this past year overseas. So again, a great effort, even with the daunting challenge of COVID. And also I have to thank, you know, our broader participants, many of the participants who are dialing in today and watching this have been close partners for us and have been working with us in very challenging environments, uh, most noteworthy just recently in Afghanistan. And I have to thank them for their commitment and dedication for remaining with us to the very end in Afghanistan. So thank you for that. Again, as I mentioned, we were very successful in having many projects and I'll just go through some of the projects highlights that we've had this past year very quickly. Uh, and we have some slides. For instance, you can see that we were uh, able to complete what's a beautiful, really stunning embassy in Mozambique and Maputo. Uh, in addition, um, we were also able to complete this year, an embassy in Niamey, Niger. Again, you, I think, uh, as you see, just the designs are and um, appearances of these are just stunning. And I know that the people on the ground have been very appreciative of the great work and the quality of the construction. Uh, in addition, we were also able to complete um, a new embassy facility in Reykjavik, Iceland. I think what you can also note from the range of these projects, just the extremes going from uh, NEMA, very dry, hot environment to, to Reykjavik, very cold. And again, I think it just reflects on the really just the, the, the skill and talents of, of all the people that we work with that were able to do this kind of work in such dramatically different environments. Uh, in addition to completing projects, we've been initiating projects. And, um, you know, you can see here that we've done a number of design awards over the past year, including here in Bangui. as well as, as you'll see here in, in Beijing, uh, this, the uh, chief of mission residence in Beijing, China. As well, in a very another challenging location in Juba, South Sudan. So I think what's, what's telling about all these designs is just how innovative, striking, and, and, and impressive they are. Here in Kathmandu, the chief of mission residence design and the design for uh, the US Embassy Moscow office entrance. Again, in, in Nairobi, Kenya, with the chief of mission residence. Here's a design award for a new embassy in, in Port Louis, in Mauritius. So from designs, we went on to construction awards, and most recently, um, just in the last week, we were able to award um, a construction award in our, for our embassy in Doha, in, in Qatar. And we are in the process of finalizing awards for other projects. And again, these were projects initially we were hoping to award in 2020, but now we're awarding in 2021, because I think you know, we've been able to successfully working with our many partners adapt and uh, take on new innovative approaches to the contracting process so that we can do these awards. And we can't do our projects without the sites. And, uh, you know, real estate is always very challenging. We're looking at properties that uh, will be uh, platforms for us that will be in locations that will project the U.S. Uh, government well and be uh, you know, located well for people to access and and, uh, and be able to provide the services that we need on the ground. So it's a really challenging effort, but 
again, we've been very fortunate given just the professionalism, effort, and dedication of our teams in, in accomplishing a number of really challenging acquisitions over this past year. So with that, you know, I think what I hope everybody was able to see from this is that really under some very difficult conditions over the past year, uh, we were able to be very successful across many fronts from acquisitions to design to construction to completion. And again, I have to thank all our advisors, all those contractor partners that we've worked with over the past year who made that possible. Um, and again, you know, we, in today's discussion, you know, we'll be looking at some of the key factors that influences our designs, our approaches, our processes. But I do want to note that in the coming year, we will continue to have dialogue collaboration with our IG members, and we'll look to draw on the, the full cross section of expertise that the members bring, uh, looking at our portfolio holistically from acquisitions, real estate to construction, life cycle management, facilities operations. So I look forward to more uh, specific conversations on all those different aspects of our work, essentially from soup to nuts. And finally, in a personal note, I want to thank the IAG members for their support for OBO, our organization, the Department of State in general. And I want to thank the entire OBO team. This is likely my last IAG meeting. It's a very sad moment for me, um, but I'm hope hopefully can dial in, in in future events. As I prepare for my uh, next assignment in the coming month, uh, when I transition over to be the director for the department's career development and assignments office. So I'm essentially going from buildings to people. Um, but I will still take stay in close touch with everybody here at OBO and our partners. I'm pleased to note that our new OBO director, again, who should be starting in the coming month, has been identified, and he's very familiar for many of you. Uh, he was my predecessor as principal deputy director, Ambassador William Moser, and he'll be returning from Kazakhstan and again serving in OBO as our future director. So I know that he's very excited about the prospect of reengaging with everybody here in OBO and we'll look with all our partners and with the IAG members. And again, continuing this dialogue, conversation, and collaboration. Uh, so with that, thank you all very much for the opportunity to kick this off. I'll go ahead and pass, off, pass it off to Christy and, and we'll go into the meat of our uh, program today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Henry. And um, hopefully my, my mic volume has fixed. Um, yes. I was going for Barry White in the opening, so I hope that came across appropriately. Um, I'm glad to know all of you have my phone number because I, I might have shut down the phone systems. With the, with the, I think my favorite message was, it sounds like you have a subwoofer in your throat. That was good. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, so hopefully it's better. Um, we are really excited to um, welcome Deborah Lehman Smith and Christian Bailey as our peer review chairs for the readout this year. Um, for those of you that 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 haven't been uh, a, a part of our annual meetings before, um, we we have this great opportunity for you guys to see uh, the peer activity over the course of the year, from the last meeting to this meeting, um, the projects and the programs that we ask them to look at. Um, this is their opportunity to talk to you about, about the ways that they um, made recommendations and, and helped us improve our approach to both projects and, um, and initiatives within the organization. So I am going to kick it off. I'm going to kick it over to, uh, to Deborah and Christian. Well, thank you. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Henry, for the uh, introductions. Um, okay, so Deborah and I'll uh, take, take you all through the next uh, eight industri you know, industry advisory group reviews that have taken place over the last year. Um, very interesting projects, diverse in terms of seven are buildings, one's a round table. There's also an ambassador's residence as well. And I think it'll show that each of the, uh, each has a unique story uh, that tells uh, about the role uh, that architecture and landscape plays uh, in the language of um, di diplomacy and the communities that it impacts. And so we'll get started with uh, the U.S. Embassy in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this was designed by Morphosis. Uh, it's a design build contract to be scheduled uh, for the year 2022. And uh, this had three advisory reviews uh, with Mark Robbins um, of the Acad American Academy of Rome, Susanna Drake of DLAN Studio, Craig Schwitter of Burrow Happel. And uh, just a quick summary before I hand it over to Mark for his review. Um, both the existing uh, US Embassy 
uh, as well as the site for the future new, uh, new embassy compound uh, will be located in, the, in that diplomatic quarter. Uh, the, the general organization of the diplomatic quarter is based on the two central boulevards that connect the two entrances to the DQ and the majority of the foreign embassy plots are arranged along those boulevards. And branching off those boulevards are a series of residential clusters. Uh, I think one of the goals of, of the designer, uh, Morphosis, is you know, design an embassy that's inspiring positive workplace uh, balance, fusion of traditional and contemporary styles, cultures, and activities. My understanding was a pretty spirited uh, dialogue with the IAG members and the, uh, the architects and the team. So, Mark, I'll hand it over to you. Mark Robbins, are you able to? Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm on, am I unmuted? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, I, I just wanted to thank uh, my uh, uh, partners in the review, Susanna Drake of D-Land Studios and uh, Craig Schwitter of Bureau Happel. Uh, it, we had um, several meetings with uh, Morphosis uh, which was the sort of typical review schedule. And uh, after the second review, we had requested uh, another meeting uh, to further develop the scheme. The scheme originated with uh, a series of courtyards that were linked along uh, a, a more public street, it's called Main Street. And this seemed fairly clear as uh, as a diagram. The site itself sits on a uh, uh, high and very dry uh, mesa, but it is surrounded by wadis, a, a, a beautiful uh, kind of irrigated uh, plain. So uh, I, I think after the first review, people were heartened by the circulation and a desire to make um, uh, these series of oases throughout um, the site. After the second review, uh, the, the panel felt that um, the landscape strategy uh, needed to be commensurate with uh, the ideas about the building. And there was a de-emphasis on the main street, both given its nomenclature as well as its formal relationship uh, to the scheme. And uh, this uh, then became uh, the operative metaphor was really had to do with tributaries and made reference to uh, the surrounding uh, wadi. Um, the, the upshot of having this extra meeting was uh, I think uh, uh, our ability to see a greater development on the facade with um, uh, Briesolais, as well as the the uh, plantings of the courtyard, and a, 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 a kind of the level of articulation that we had seen in the residence, which is built into the side of the building complex, um, and that was then carried out throughout. Um, the parts of the building we were able to see. Thanks, Mark. Sure. Yeah, so this is one of the interior courtyards and there was a great attention on uh, the part of Morphosis to make a great transparency throughout the building. And certainly from the main circulation spine externally, you can see into these interior courtyards and the interior courtyards allow you to see the exterior space. And uh, at the edges, you have space that's used by the wider uh, community, by families, um, as well as uh, diplomats and visiting guests. Um, I'm pleased to announce the second uh, project embassy that we're reviewing is the U.S. Embassy in Hanoi. And as Henry had said, this actually the site was 
awarded, uh, actually acquired this year. And the architect is EYP. And the site consists of uh, two office towers, north and south, a marine quarters, and a series of annex buildings. And the, there were two different industry advisory reviews. And they were headed by Marion Weiss from Weissman Freddy, Jim Richard, Richard Kennedy, and Jay Taylor from Magnuson Clemensek. And the challenge as we went through this uh, project this week really was that how do you create these really beautiful campus within this ever changing, rapidly growing city of Hanoi? And within the second peer review, there was really a focus of how does the team really make sure that the mission of the US diplomatic um, status in Hanoi is met? So with that, I'm going to leave um, or introduce Marion, who's going to lead the effort for this to really discuss what happened during these two reviews. Marion. Thank you, Deborah. And um, I, I uh, want to also thank the, the peers that uh, we were working together with, uh, Jim Richard and Jay Taylor, who Deborah mentioned, we had the opportunity twice to uh, review this project. And what was very interesting is initially there was um, enormous challenge actually on this site with a city being invented around it to balance the potential relationship of the landscape and very robustly scaled buildings with the smaller collection of buildings that you see on the left hand side of your slide in the support area. Um, UIP had presented three strategies, tranquility, harmony and flow, each drawing from traditions that uh, were found either in the Hanoian courtyard organization uh, with a red palette color as an initial idea. Um, another one motivated by the idea of its adjacency to Kaigu Park, um, which uh, again had cross axial circulation. And the last one called Flow, which was inspired with spaces uh, which would be forming uh, community spaces with the primary tall building closest to the edge of the city and the uh, office building and adjacent smaller buildings heading um, into a cascade towards the park. Um, in our discussions, what we realized is that uh, each of these concepts in many ways had aspects that were compelling. We didn't choose one versus another, but talked about drawing the strengths of abstraction that came through one and others that actually could draw the landscape language together so that there could be some unifying elements that operated like strata or datums from a plinth that could be uh, a terrace, which you can see on this building that's facing the park, even with the MSGR lower and then a unifying datum around the edge of the city where all the support uh, structures were. And so it was an idea of simplification, but also amplifying the collecting of water, both in the expression on the facade and in the landscape, so that this uh, overall concept could uh, create a reciprocity between the buildings and the landscape. It's what was most compelling, I think, to all of us, though, was this incredible opportunity to create a diplomatic presence in the city that was both uh, expressive of the urbanity of the tall buildings around, but also embracing the landscape uh, that is so compelling to the park. And if there's any additional comments from Jim Richard or Jay Taylor, I just wanted to do a call out and see if they wanted to add. You can see the invention of the city and the site coming together in this last image. Right. So, uh, by the way, Deborah, um, just a, on that last slide there, it is it is pretty amazing that the site has been acquired and it's it, the momentum is underway so quickly. I agree. It's okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to the uh, Carousel, which is a mission to the Dutch uh, Caribbean. Um, this is a new U.S. Uh, consulate uh, campus. This was designed by Karen Timberlake and his team. Uh, the design build contract is scheduled for uh, the year 22. And uh, this, again, this had two advisory reviews. Um, uh, Frank Siami with Siami Construction, Matt Oppenheimer of Silman Structural, and myself. Um, the, uh, this was unique in that the, um, the the um the new uh compound involved an expansion 
on top of it, and as well as a, a new uh, consulate uh, with the acquired land. Um, it involved a new office building, support annex, utility building, and a combined main and consulate compound access uh, control, which was uh, part of the discussions as well. Um, service compound access and a pedestrian compound access, which was a little unique as well, and, um, a fit and a space for the vehicles and staff parking. This uh, existing historic site um, was a former Roosevelt uh, house. And so that was um, addressed as part of this uh, project as well. Um, you know, this, um, when, when um, they presented it, they had three very interesting schemes. Um, and, it, and it's a very challenging site. Uh, it's an L-shaped site that's on a hill overlooking the town from one angle, and then it's right facing the highway on the other. So the way that they addressed each um, area and view was important and part of the, uh, the dialogue that we had with the team in those uh, industry advisory reviews. Um, the other thing that was uh, important uh, that we discussed was the connection between the, the two um, new office buildings and how to uh, pronounce that uh, as a main entrance point in terms of the procession from the main uh, from the from the combined uh, main CAC, um, and so that was that was part of how you know some of our comments about just bringing clarity to that, making the visitor entrance and procession um, a little bit uh, clear, and then also um, besides that was the context with the color is a very vibrant um, uh, island with the um, the context. And so how does that play into it? Um, so the, our, uh, with the with the team that was on it, um, for, I'll hand it over to Frank. Um, but just a note on Frank and Nat, I mean, they were their structure, their, con their constru construction, but I think they have a gift for landscape design and as well as uh, architectural design. They're very uh, supportive in that. So Frank, do you want to speak yeah. about the, uh, yeah, I'm the sorry. spacing? I can't, I'm sorry, I can't get my camera going. Could you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, well, as as you mentioned, the uh, it was very important in terms of the landscaping. The terraces move up the hillside uh, and the overall character and length of the walls required that the walls and the building had a very close dialogue. That was one of the things that the group had commented on. Uh, we also thought that the curtain wall was important because of the fins. We were concerned about how it would perform. And I thought it might be good to talk to some qualified curtain wall contractors to get some design assist information. And, and one thing that I really felt strongly about was finishing out the shell space because it's the most cost effective way to do it. You avoid the cost of remobilization escalation, et cetera. But I thought it was a, uh, a good a good review and I really want to thank Nat and Christian for all their input. Um, it was it was a good experience. Well, thank you. Thank you, Frank. And I think that um, in summary, I think the design team uh, listened very well um, and then came back with uh, a, a lot of uh, great ideas uh, during our second review. and. You know, we think that it was it beautifully fits in with the site and the context, and it's something that the U.S. and the host countries can be very proud of. So, thank you for that. The next project is a U.S. embassy um, located in Kinshasa, which is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the design architect is a EA architect, or shop architect, and this was a design build contract that is scheduled to be awarded in 2022. The project consists of a campus, which is an embassy office building, diplomatic apartments, uh, security guard quarters, pool and cabana, and several um, annex and adjacent buildings. And really, there were two peer reviews for this. And the peer IAG team was Jim Burnett of OJB Landscape, uh, Nico Kinsel from Atelier 10, and Claire Weiss from WXYZ Studio. And it's 
looked, I mean, obviously this is a really beautifully designed building, but there were many challenges and constraints uh, within the site and the size of the site limited access while at the same time focusing on the scale, uh, massing, and an urban canopy, uh, and also contributing to the local culture and bringing that through the project. So with that, I would like to um, have Claire Weiss do the readout from their two IAG reviews and tell you more about this project. Uh, okay. Deborah, thank you. And. Um, I'm going to try and represent us three, uh, Jim, Nico, myself, but Nico, surprise you, I'm going to make you do a couple of closing statements. Um, a lot of the themes that that others have spoken about, about the really challenges of these sites being acquired and really using every inch, not only in planning what is going to be the design build project in this case, but future expansion ended up being a lot of kind of uh, what, how we weld it, you know, how we melded our way through these three schemes. So I want to just describe a little bit that the three strategy shop brought to OBO and to the review civil edges, which is really like they were trying to minimize the footprint and create more as much flexibility for this expansion as possible and in a way make the circulation uh, prominent. And then urban canopy, which I think the roots of what you're seeing in the end scheme really work based there, uh, which is looking at the climate issues and the landscape and horizontal issues as being really important. And then finally, the, they tried a Kind of vertical, they call it a vertical city scheme, which kind of put the mat more of the massing in a compact place. And I think what was really important is the challenges of the site where there wasn't even developed roads all the way around. So, what there between the first and second review, what was really wonderful about the discussion was we were able to move from a kind of site discussion about how this really is a new embassy with people living there with all of the components of the Marines being on site and everything, being able to understand this as a community and as a walkable community. And that was kind of inspired an ability on the second review to really focus on materiality because then you could discuss how the climate issues and, and the facade issues in choosing terracotta could connect to the fact that this, no matter what the architects did, was going to be larger in scale than what was there today. But the, but ultimately, and you know, I still think this relates to heat island effect. So, Nico, I'm kind of giving you a chance to talk about why. In the next slide, you spent so much time talking about the interior. If you go out onto the next one, that would be great. Yes why actually the interior life of these buildings and how they related to the can how the ability to maybe live and work under these canopied spaces and what the feeling of the interior was and how the circulation and really the sides of the buildings work together worked as an extension of the site plan so i think there was a lot of admiration on our side for the integration of outside and inside, knowing the restrictions for security reasons of how challenging this is for architects, that shop was able to in, I believe, you know, there in the final review to really create, um, and we hoped even in the, the more accessory buildings, even in the buildings that were not the NOB, a sense of this language of um, terracotta, and of kind of that play of light and shadow and the wood carving, which related uh, to the heritage in Kinshasa of craft, how that all pulled everything together. So in my last 30 seconds, Nico, is there anything I missed that you thought was critical to our discussion? No, I, I think this was a, it was a really engaged and very positive discussion. I think shop responded very well to the comments that we were able to give them. I think 
I, what was really, it is a really difficult program on that site because it needed to be both representative and private because it has a residential component and has a significant transportation footprint because of the, because of the, the way the transportation also works around the site. So I think they've done, they've managed this very well. And I, as you said, there was a lot of discussion about how do you create comfort in this climate comfort, both in the, when it's hot and sunny, but also when there's significant rain for how people move between the building components efficiently and, and comfortably. Uh, and I think the, the facade expression, they did a really inter a great job of creating kind of like a family of languages or a family of components that form the language that were differently scaled for the kind of like residential components and the, the, the NOB that were really appropriate. And I really commend them to not do a glass box, but something that is very thoughtful in the amount of openness and framed views and, and shading and how it integrated into um, it, to have a really um, great climate response that is that at the same time creates wonderful architecture. I hope that's what you wanted me to say, Claire. You know, that was great. Thank you. Well, and I thank you both. Um, excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, the, moving on to the U.S. Embassy in uh, Port Louis, Mauritius. This is a island, um, if you're not familiar, off the, in the Indian Ocean, um, I guess near Madagascar. Um, and this was an interesting project. It's a new U.S. Embassy there, um, designed by Richard Kennedy Architects, with a design-build um, contract, which is scheduled for the year 2022. And this had two advisory reviews um, with Nat Oppenheimer of Silman, uh, David Rubin of Land Collective. Fortunately, he won't be here today, but he was very insightful, especially with the landscape uh, and myself. The executive summary, um, the new U.S. Embassy project in Port Louis uh, is, is uh, being designed as part of a newly acquired 11.77 acre site um in mauritius and it's part of the mocha uh smart city which is an initiative that the country is doing and so the the architects tied into that and was part of the innovative approach that they took in terms of climate and culture and and landscape which were huge components of this project uh, the project it also included a new office building warehouse support annex and a centralized recreation facility um, and then there's a there also was consideration and design for the future phase two for the marine security guard residents in an annex building um, that's part of that was part of the design and the master planning of the project um, on the design part the Richard Bauer uh, came to uh, the presentation with three uh, pretty amazing and different uh, schemes, uh, tessellated bar, the the caldera court, and the spine and pedal. And it was a very uh, interesting discussion because we we sort of left the the first meeting. I think there was you know it wasn't fully unanimous, but there was a leaning towards uh, and a strong uh, leaning towards the spine and pedal, uh, which is an interesting way of organizing the project. And I think it was when. Jim Richard at the end of it said that what makes that innovative in his mind and his team's mind was just the configuration of these clusters around the spine, creating these intimate courtyards. And uh, I think that the whole um, team thought that was pretty innovative and uni unique for an uh, embassy co uh, compound and the way it's organized in the processional. The views, the ge they took a deep dive into the geography, the topography, the climate and that informed a lot of the architecture. So I, I do, you know, I think Olin was on the landscape. They did an amazing uh, precedent study that informed uh, how this fits in with the uh, site in the mountains. So I reckon I, I commend them as well as Richard uh, Kennedy that did an amazing job. Um, and then I'll hand it over to uh, Nat. Um, discuss the other aspects of the project um Nat? yeah i'll be very brief and i i really appreciate first of all i appreciate christy and lauren inviting me to both uh, 
uh, Curacao and Mauritius, although we didn't get to do site visits, unfortunately, but it was quite a <laughs> tropical set of uh, peer reviews. Yeah, as, as Krista mentioned, I think it was a really great review and especially rewarding, um, I think, for all sides of the review as, as uh, the team came back in the second review with a lot of real refinements um, and, and it seemed to really be a good dialogue back and forth. And I think the primary point that, uh, that I would make uh, pull out of what Kristen said is the original discussion of the spine and pedal felt almost a little inefficient in the way the buildings operated. But I think as we dove deeper with the team, it became very clear that it was the right uh, approach for this project in many ways. Um, and while I love to focus on architecture and landscape in these peer reviews, I think there's a real opportunity as well structurally in that the pedals each offered uh, really strong um, support for the spine, which could become this real floating element with, uh, with very little structure involved and really stitch the buildings together in a wonderful way. Um, the peer review was, as many of these are in my experience, was wonderful in that it, uh, David was incredible and Christian, and, and there was a real great discussion of the sort of macro processional through the site. And we even got down into the, you know, the, the refinement of the sort of entry and lobby um, and the materiality around that and how it was almost um, too refined in certain ways. So there was great discussions both of the entire site and how that felt and how you feel entering the building um, and the, the playing up of the lightness of the spine um, a little more than was originally depicted. So um, all around just, just a really Great effort. The architects were fantastic and, and the, the discussion um, great as always. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, thanks, Nat. And, and just to add one last thing with the, the pedals, that was such an important part. Those are the clusters. You know, those were inspired by the outcrop forms of the nature and the rock. Uh, and so that was one thing we did kind of push them to, if that is what they wanted, you know, maybe work on a little bit of variety in the height and articulation and how that's seen from the highway instead of just a continuous uh what seemed to be a continuous wall but to really uh you know explore those volumes and pronounce them and i think they did a really good job coming back and and presenting that so again thank you guys and i'd like to introduce the uh new u.s embassy in juba south sudan and to me this really represents the best of the obo Juba is the newest capital city in the world, and we um, are doing, uh, it was uh, Miller Hall is a design architect. It was a design build contract, and it's supposed to be awarded uh, in 2022. And you can see that if we go to the building, now that you all know where Juba is, it's actually on the White Nile, which is quite wonderful. But it was really a challenged and constrained site um, not really constrained because there's really nothing there, a lack of infrastructure, and really, really a new city to create something new and very, very different. There were two peer reviews on this project, and the peer advisor um, group was Robert Svedberg from TV Design, Julie Snow from Snow Krylik, and Patrick Crosby from the Crosby Group. And as we've been discussing this, beyond this project being incredibly symbolic, is how do you really um, do a really wonderful site, something that is really unique and special with really a lack of any infrastructure and a lack of context within that. So, Julie, uh, if you could take this for us and really continue the discussion that I know were very, very interesting and a lot of different comments that happened through them. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I I, one of the uh, astounding sort of pieces of reviewing projects for several years is um, every project seems so incredibly unique. And uh, Juba was probably an extreme uh, of that uh, experience because uh, there were so many challenges on this site. As you can see, uh, the context is uh, quite basic one and two story buildings, very small buildings. And uh, the question is, how do you uh, insert uh, a new uh, embassy compound into this context without seeming, uh, you know, incredibly monumental? And uh, I think the, the other 
major question here is uh, how to create a resilient embassy in a space in a city, uh, if you want to uh, use that term, uh, that you'd have to use it rather loosely uh, for Juba. That uh, has no basic infrastructure. I mean, there, there's no water, sewer, power, anything going on here. So uh, that all needed to be addressed uh, in the design. And, and, and finally, how do you represent democratic principles in this challenging sort of uh, climate, uh, uh, political context, and economic context? Uh, so the first peer review uh, really focused on site organization. And I think we were very compelled by uh, the scheme that developed a very nice uh, sort of landscaped area based on uh, some rock outcroppings uh, that really uh, organized the site into the sort of support structures. And then uh, the embassy uh, office building and uh, residences. So uh, that was important. And then the, the idea of using a courtyard scheme, which was uh, a way of not only creating energy with uh, solar uh, panels, but also uh, creating a, a varied group of sort of social spaces uh, on the site. Um, and, I, and I think every uh, of our design reviews really began with the question of how to create uh, a sustainable design. And so there was a, a great deal of attention placed on uh, power production on the site and uh, obviously a reduction of, of consumption of power. And then water was obviously a huge defining principle of how to, how to uh, filter uh, water and how to uh, really uh, reduce consumption. So uh, th these themes uh, were really uh, critical as we began to look at the project. And um, so, I guess I would say, you know, the major question after the first review began with uh, how to adhere to their stated themes of simplicity and humility in this South Sudan context and how to give spaces a human scale, air movement, light, and material quality. Uh, in the second peer review, we saw a more developed design based on the themes that were begun in the courtyard scheme. Uh, so here, oh, here you're seeing that that sort of landscape space with the rock outcroppings. So uh, here we were really looking at a more developed material strategy and we encouraged the team uh, to consider reducing the building height uh, in, in whatever way they could and uh, to look at more articulated, articulated facade apertures, uh, referring back to the rich studies that they had done of projects in Africa uh, and by African architects, uh, such as I think Francis Carey. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, Rob Svedberg if he has any comments that he would like to tag on here. Sure, thanks, Julie. I think um, you know, this was an extraordinary context for a for a building, both economically and politically and socially. Um, and one of the one of the unique things about this project was that all the folks that are going to work in this campus actually live on this campus. So it's a residential campus. So the building in front of you is actually part of the residential uh, part of the campus. And so that kind of adds a completely different dynamic to how this entire site works. Um, you know, the landscape was extraordinary related to some rock outcroppings and, and kind of this of the three options ability to take advantage of the topography and these kind of natural rock outcroppings as a design feature. And, you know, also due to the extraordinary nature of the siting in this, this location, um, there was a lot of discussions about constructability. How do you bring materials in? How do you construct it? And, and really the nature of how this building gets built in this challenging context, how you get things to the site really became a, an important driver in the overall discussion. Thanks, Rob. It was uh, really a great discussion and we're looking forward to seeing what happens next in Juba. As we all are. Thank you, Julie and Rob. 
Okay, thank you guys. And um, moving on, we, we're kind of running out of time, so I'll try to speed this up a little bit. Um, for the chief mission of residence in Beijing, this is a project designed by Richard Kennedy with a contract award for the year 22. This had one advisory review, and it's unique because it's an uh, embassy residence, almost treated as a hotel, very interesting uh, uh, aspects and functions. And this had the uh, panel comprised of Greg Reeves of Lehman Smith McLeish, Dan Cecil of Lyra, and Susan Drake of D-Land Studio. Um, Greg, do you want to uh, take us through that one? Sure, Christian. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Um, I was really pleased to be able to join this review with Susanna and Dan, and I think, as you mentioned, it's a really interesting and important program, the uh, Chief of Mission Residence, because not only is it sort of a private and secure residence for the ambassador and their family and some guest suites for sort of high level visitors to the country, but it also serves a really important diplomatic function um, separate from the embassy. Um, and you know this is all this is all all of those functions are kind of taking place in this series of representational rooms that include kind of a reception hall, an important dining hall, large salon, and then smaller spaces as well, like a library or a, or a, a parlor where smaller conversations, kind of more intimate conversations can take place. And the other thing is that the adaptability and kind of scale of the events that take place here is really important. And so we were happy to learn about that in a little bit more detail. The team told us that there could be hundreds of events a year taking place, sometimes multiple events per day. So I think the serviceability, adaptability um, of the spaces is really important. And Jim and the Richard Kennedy team really paid a lot of attention to that as well. Um, if we just go back one, the site is also really constrained. Um, there's a lot of security, obviously, setbacks. And it's already a small site, um, pretty small, within this kind of park-like uh, embassy district in Beijing, just to the east of the Forbidden City. It's important to note that this residence is actually separate and apart from the U.S. Embassy. Um, so it really stands alone as its own kind of diplomatic presence, like right, pretty much right in the heart of the capital. Um, so that's really an important consideration as well. And we really appreciated that Jim and the team thought through that fact that this really stands alone as a more intimate kind of diplomatic um, facility where you can provide more intimate conversations in those so the combination of bigger and smaller spaces where there could be sort of breakout conversations and negotiations going on. And if you think about the embassy as something that's more formal, where there might be a more formal ceremonial signing of an agreement taking place at the embassy, at the residence, it's more about the you know nitty gritty sort of one on one conversations really kind of the hard work of diplomacy and so providing the spaces and kind of fostering those conversations was really important. Um, if we look at the site organization, all of the schemes we looked at three different I would call them architectural planning schemes. Um, all of them followed the same uh, overall site strategy, which made a lot of sense with the public entry coming in from the south into the representational spaces that were gathered into the center of the site, more private um, residential functions and the guest quarters to the to the west, where it's a little bit more private over there, and then all the service, which is super important uh, in this case, uh, on the east side, served from an east side um, side road, basically. We looked at three schemes. The first is this so-called terrace scheme, which really follows the logic, as Jim was explaining, of a traditional representational home with the representational kind of function spaces, public spaces on the ground floor, high ceilings, with opening to the outdoor space. Um, and I should say all of the schemes, there was a real priority about connecting the indoor space, indoor function area with outdoor function areas. Um, but in the Terra scheme, actually all that functional space was on the ground floor, and then the private spaces were segregated to the upper floor, so we're on a piano nobile. Um, then there was a so-called second scheme, the so-called yin-yang scheme, which was based on a series of intersecting courtyards. Uh, that's the image we're looking at right now. <clears> that sort of organized the functional spaces, the more public spaces from the private spaces. So this, I think, is the, the entry courtyard, which then tied in through the functional representational spaces to a back sort of functional kind of 
um, yeah, here you go, sort of a, a, a representational garden, you could say, that ties into all those representational spaces. And then these also interlocked with some smaller courtyards, one for the private residential function and one that was almost like a service court um, for the service areas. This particular site plan actually really uh, leveraged some accessory buildings. There's a pool cabana. There's actually a pool for the ambassador, which is quite nice. Um, there is <clears throat> the security offices, some things like that that can happen outside of the secure uh, zone in the center that the team really used to kind of frame views and frame courtyards um, to expand the space of the site. And we thought that that really maximized the usage of the site, which made a lot of sense. And then the third scheme <clears throat> is this pavilion scheme, which really prioritized the prominence of the pavilion and those representational spaces, and then put the private, more private um, residential to the east flanking to the east, to the west, I'm sorry, and then the service spaces to the east. And the group really thought that this one kind of had a really strong sense of presence, uh, clarity of form. Uh, we had some, I think, productive discussion around what is the architectural expression of the pavilion. Um, I, uh, Dan's on, Dan Cecil has also joined, he's here today. He might talk about the structural opportunities here, but we kind of thought in terms of the organization of the site and the architectural planning, this what was heading in the right direction. We thought we could also learn though from some of the site planning of the other schemes. Um, Dan, I, I think you are on uh, on board here if you have a moment and wanted to add anything. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, we, um, we, we talked a little bit about shape finding and, um, and the expression of this particular piece. Um, the, um, the site is an interesting 1, because there's a lot of program on a relatively small site. And so, uh, Jim and his team have some really sort of interesting challenges there and they really. Really are rising up to meet it, um, as it related to sort of more general structural questions that we, we, we focused on and, and. Admittedly, we've had only 1 meeting with, with Jim and his team. So we've had the 1st review and we really look forward to seeing how it evolves. Uh, but we definitely spent some time with them uh, discussing strategies for uh, reducing carbon emissions as they're associated with the making of the building. Um, and um, on that score, what we, 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 we uh, are hopeful that they can find ways to integrate the architecture and a structure in a way that um, creates hopefully some, some repetition, some potentials for modular design. Um, and, you know, we're just excited to see how it comes together. Thank you guys. Very good. Okay. okay. <clears throat> the last, uh, industry advisory review really focuses on something unique and different. These discussions were started in 2020 and they really deal with the impact of COVID globally on the real estate, uh, commercial and residential market, and how that would impact the portfolio. So the team, peer team was Greg Canito from Corvius, Maureen Ehrenberg from Blue Sky, Michael Norton from JP Morgan Chase, and Barry Scribner from JLL. So what I really would like to do is have this, um, hand this over to Maureen to uh, really talk about it since she's much more knowledgeable than I about all the different things that have happened in the last two years and how that affects the portfolio. Maureen? Yeah, Deborah, thank you very much. Yes, all of um, my fellow uh, roundtable panelists uh, share a global real estate and facilities perspective, and it really helped to drive the discussion. Um, our focus was on global operating standards, operational excellence, innovation, in a very rapidly changing real estate and facilities industry. Um, if you look at the portfolio at hand, it is uh, just really an incredible portfolio of buildings and properties. And we looked at a holistic portfolio management approach, talking about the first, the capital equipment maintenance, the life cycle planning, the importance of that resiliency. Stakeholder experience has come to the forefront, whether it's our visitors, occupants, staff, the ops teams, and even the local community is very important as we consider the experience that we're curating. 
um, at the at the sites. Leading industry trends um, in facilities in the property markets and workplace are all um, kind of converging together to drive this kind of new normal for commercial real estate. The return to office was also a big impact. And what we looked at with return to office was also the really strong propelled dynamics that were accelerated with ESG. And so whether it was the environment, social impact, or um, what is going on in the local community and then the governance aspects, that all drives um, how we look at preparedness, but then also operational excellence moving forward. So from a preparedness perspective, we did look at industry best standards for safety, health and wellness, HVAC or HVAC, um, cleanliness, um, indoor air quality and sustainability and how all of that really has to be considered when looking at the maintenance programs, looking at the operational programs and the procedures. Um, the industry is digitizing. It's going from a very static industry to a very dynamic industry. And that's where the conversation around smart buildings, smart workplace, smart systems, digitized workflows came in, particularly around r &M, repairs and maintenance. Um, we also looked at what the transformation um, requires as far as consistency. So in the end, uh, in addition to renewable energy and conservation, user experience, more flexible use of space, um, and then also just really understanding how the operations really impact any of the um, human experience from the stakeholders we discussed. We then also um, moved into the, industry, um, the real estate markets, because, of course, if you think about all of the areas we just discussed, it is driving valuation. And so when we look at the properties around the world, uh, what we've been looking at is how the pandemic has impacted property values, lease rates in the various markets. And while the different markets are responding differently, the values uh, have been depressed and they're starting to come back. Concessions from landlords continue to be pretty strong. And while different global markets are recovering differently, the one trend that we have seen across the board is that facilities trends are all very consistent. And so the importance of training and a new approach to how we operate for the next five years is gonna be very important. So Thanks. thank you. Thank you, Maureen, and we all look forward to the next five years and the outcome of all of this. Thanks to uh, Deborah and Christian um, for that really great session on readout. Um, we're going to make up that time. <laughs> right, sorry about that. Angel <laughs> and Angel's up next, so I'm just going <laughs> to cut that in half. Um, no, but honestly, what uh, the readout that you guys just gave and the projects that you talked about, I mean, it's really why so many of us are uh, tuned in and want to know this is the whole meaning of it. So um, we're, we're, we're really thankful for all of you guys taking the time to um, look back and reflect on on the year and your contributions, um, you know, which I, I know I, for those of you that don't attend the peer reviews, you know, we usually open up with while well, you're looking at this one project and we'll talk specifically about what's happening here. Um, the effect of those conversations really reverberates throughout the organization and our approach. So thank you um, for that. That really great um, summary. Um, thank, you. Next, uh, thank you. Okay, next up is um, is our Embassy Effect and Embassy 2050 Innovating the Foundation of American Diplomacy session. Um, this is moderated by Angel Dizan, our Managing Director for Program Development Coordination Support. And he'll be joined by um, a few speakers. Embassy Effect, we've got Curtis Clay, our Director of Architecture, and Jason Delara, our Director of Real Estate Acquisitions and Disposals. And then Embassy 2050, we're really excited to welcome Rick Sullivan, our Director of Design and Engineering, um, as along with Jamie Cook, who is a partner at Crook and Sexton, um, as well as Kimberly Gray, one of our academic advisors on Embassy 2050 from Northwestern University. Um, so, Angel, without further ado, since I'm cutting your time in half, I'm going to just turn it right over to you. Thanks, Christy, both for the introduction and the cutting of the time for something that I think is super crazy important. But, um, <laughs> you know, over the last couple of years, OBO has been developing and introducing to y'all uh, the Embassy Fact and Embassy 2050. Uh, today, we're going to go a little bit deeper so you get to get a sense of kind of what's going on behind the scenes, some of the folks that are involved uh, that are helping to us to achieve our mission and helping to influence our business so that we can start to be the, the, the best in government. So uh, the first topic that we're going to talk about is the embassy effect. And, you know, I've talked to a whole bunch of you all about, you know, how important our work is and that 
to providing the diplomatic platform is a, is a very purposeful mission in and of itself. The reality is the embassy effect adds another level of importance and impact uh, that, that makes our work really unique and drives people to really want to be a part of it. So the, the team has put together a video about the embassy effect that uh, I'd like to have them share with you now. The Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations directs the Worldwide Overseas Building Program for the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Government serving under Chief of Mission Authority around the world. As one of the world's largest, most experienced real estate developers, we build and operate American embassies and consulates, as well as housing and support facilities worldwide. Our facilities are spaces for diplomacy, building relationships in support of common group community engagement. OBO develops state-of-the-art facilities that are secure, resilient, technologically innovative, and sustainable, produced by the best in American design, architecture, construction, and management. We have a portfolio valued over 71 billion US dollars with 290 locations worldwide. Currently, we have more than 25,000 real estate assets around the world. Since 1999, following support for a capital construction program, we have built 167 new diplomatic facilities and currently have over 50 active major construction projects valued at over 18 billion US dollars. For a new U.S. embassy like the one in Brasilia, it's, it's really presenting this opportunity for the American and the host nation's design community, including engineers and contractor teams, to collaborate and really translate an urban space into a civic campus. In this way, an embassy has this potential to really enrich an already interesting neighborhood and context by adding to it, uh, serving as almost like an anchor and making a positive example. The consulate in Milan, which we began uh, with our with OBO a, a few years ago, has been a unique experience. In fact, that it is a heritage site. It's got a history to it that is first uniquely Milan, historic structures, uh, a place where the public came together. As you move through these buildings and through these landscapes, as you approach the consulate, you really take in the history of what was there and what is coming towards the future. OBO is more than the buildings themselves. We create an ongoing positive effect on the local communities. This positive effect or embassy effect can be seen in three distinct areas, economic impact, environmental impact, and social impact. The newly constructed U.S. Embassy in London contributed significantly to the local redevelopment effort in the Nine Elms neighborhood through the inclusion of public amenities such as a plaza, a park, bicycle paths, and a new pedestrian greenway connecting the embassy to the nearest public transport station. The new embassy in London through design work and through extensive collaboration with uh, the city's government adjacent developers, neighbors, and community organization connects the landscape of the river's edge to the new linear park that was proposed to run from Vauxhall to Battersea is over 18,000 new units of residential development. In creating the new embassy, we provide an actual landscape, a public park that's open uh, to all the citizens uh, to enjoy. The United States is currently investing over $1 billion in construction in Mexico and $1 billion in construction in Saudi Arabia, with new embassies in Mexico City and Riyadh and many new consulates in both countries. These projects have included a commitment to improving site conditions on an industrial site, encourage nearby development of hotels, food, schools, and residential and recreational complexes and provided an upgrade in security for the entire neighborhood. A significant aspect of our work is to create a positive impact on the environment. 
OBO develops facilities with sustainable features designed to reduce local resource consumption and generate renewable energy with consideration of local climate and environmental conditions. For example, at the new U.S. Embassy in Jakarta, where we redeveloped on a prominent site next to the Vice Presidential Palace, innovative methods are utilized to harness and conserve energy. Exterior sunshades reduce the demand for air conditioning, and covered walkways are topped with solar panels that generate power. Wastewater is treated on site and recycled into irrigation systems, lessening the burden on local utilities. Through our energy program, OBO is committed to reducing consumption, minimizing reliance on local resources, and maximizing renewable energies to drive towards net zero. Our sustainability accomplishments include achievement of over 50 LEED certifications to date, including two prestigious platinum certifications, 18 gold and 32 silver or LEED certified facilities. OBO creates a positive social impact through stewardship of culturally significant sites and by fostering cross-cultural dialogue through the arts. At our Jakarta Embassy site, we restored a heritage building which had a significant role in Indonesia's path to independence and struggle for democracy. The U.S. Art and Embassies program commissions new work, develops exhibitions, and manages public events and programming, working alongside artists, museums, galleries, universities, and private collectors. Art and Embassies facilitates community engagement artist exchanges, and collaborations with local artists in host countries, showing how art can transcend national borders and build connections among peoples. I work with art embassies over many years, and I've firsthand seen their commitment to American and international artists in showcasing their work in embassies and consulates around the world. What's always impressed me is the process they utilize to select the works for the host countries. They're works that touch on uh, common threads and create dialogues within these countries. And the works themselves become the public face of these buildings. They humanize uh, the embassies to the host countries. OBO aligns with thought leaders, academics, and innovators through our Embassy 2050 initiative. Embassy 2050 provides R&D opportunities to develop future-focused standards for our global portfolio. So at Northwestern, we've been thinking a lot about the path of change. What is the pathway by which technology will evolve from where it is today to where it could be in 2050? The future is a future in which we're gonna have very locally tailored design and, and in designing embassies, that means we're gonna learn from host countries. We're not just going to take United States technologies but we're, and, and export them. We're looking for the development of new technologies and approaches that can be very adaptive and resilient to what I consider to be the major threat of the game changer of climate change. Ultimately, our work is about connection. Architecture is a language of diplomacy. Embassies communicate who we are as a culture and represent our values. Our projects are about bringing communities together and building stronger relationships. Hi, I'm Nick Giacobbe. I'm the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Pristina, Kosovo. And I'm Phil Kosnett. I'm the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Kosovo. So we've been We've been in this building now for about two years. What do you think has been the impact of this building? Well, Nick, I think this embassy is, is just tremendous. It is, first of all, a physical manifestation of America's commitment to partnership with the people of Kosovo. Our old embassy did not have a full service consular section, which meant that if people wanted to apply for visas to the United States, they often had to drive to a neighboring country. Those days are over so we can provide much better customer service to the citizens of Kosovo. Mm -hmm. It's the only LEED certified building mm -hmm. in all of Kosovo. As the American ambassador to Kosovo, I'm proud of the investment that the American people are making in the relationship between these two great countries. At OBO, we provide spaces for living, working, and meeting together. 
we continue to look toward the future to push the boundary of what is possible through ingenuity, innovation, and collaboration. Thank you to all our host communities around the world who we continue to foster positive diplomatic relationships with and positively impact through the effect of OBO projects. So um, we started talking about embassy effect probably about 10 years ago when we first wrote the word. And, and we initially focused kind of on this economic analysis, the first item there. So this impact of rising property values, spurring economic development. And then several years later, we kind of expanded on this idea. Uh, and this was actually Mr. Dizon's contribution to the effort. And, and um, to, to add things like this social political component, um, art and embassies and, and the connection that that makes with the community and that impact. Uh, and then also the environmental piece, everything we're doing around sustainability. And this really kind of talks about our organizational maturity, right? We, we have ideas and we build on them, you know, make them better, continuously improve. And, and lots of people actually across the organization have contributed to this idea of embassy effect, and, and you kind of see it uh, play out in this kind of robust work, this video uh, that flushes out the idea. But but probably the key thing when we think about embassy effect is how we use it, right? This isn't merely an academic analysis for us, right? We're in the business of building new embassies. So that's how we use it, right? We use it to sell our program, right? To sell it locally, to sell it around the world to talk about the contributions our buildings make everywhere we go. And, and that's kind of the discussion that we recently had in Bratislava. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that in, in a couple of slides. As we move into these more developed markets, it's gonna require more selling, right? It's kind of a new challenge. So with that, let me, let me pass to Curtis. He'll uh, talk about a couple of examples of contributions uh, that our buildings have made in some of these other developed markets. And then we'll we'll touch on our kind of our case study of Bratislava. Thanks, Jason. So speaking of the economic, environmental, and social aspects that USMC brings to cities across the globe, uh, I want to start with the new embassy in London, <clears throat> which really serves as the anchor of an emerging commercial and residential district in London's central activity zone. Approximately, I'd say 10 years after planning permission was granted for the new embassy, an entirely new housing and commercial district has really emerged in the Nine Elms neighborhood. And now there's a park that runs from the, the Vauxhall Bridge to the renovated Battersea Power Station, which has really become the sustainable green centerpiece for this new revitalized district in London. Now surrounding the building, we have all types of USA cafes and other businesses that are named after the United States that have emerged throughout the neighborhood. And, you know, while the economic impact on some of the second cities we build in is immediate, immediately evident, uh, it's often overlooked how even in major global cities, the U.S. government has the ability to instigate a huge economic impact on a neighborhood. Next slide. So it was necessary for, I'd say, the architecture to be integrated seamlessly into the Nine, Nine Elms neighborhood while fully adhering to the required security setbacks. So, working with Olin the landscape architects here in Timberlake, we're able to, I believe, successfully address the requirements with an open public park that connects the campus to the neighborhood through the integration of a range of sustainable technologies, technology strategies, including the pond you see here that's integral to the site stormwater management strategy. And, and you know, beyond the economic impact, the environmental environmental impact here is also worth highlighting uh, with sustainable initiatives, including brownfield redevelopment, natural habitat creation, healthy responsibility source building materials. You know, the embassy harnesses these renewable energy sources, including the solar energy from photovoltaic cells you see on the roof, and the geothermal energy that we generate through a ground source heat pump. Actually, we harness this energy to actually feed heat into the neighboring buildings in the neighborhood through an agreement with the city. Next slide. And then there's the social and cultural exchange that occurs between the artists in the host country. And ours is, I believe, very robust and meaningful. Here in London, 
We have about a $1 million public art program that allows for artists from each country to engage with each other in the production of collaborative pieces that are installed in our buildings. Uh, this piece here in the upper right, it's a site-specific frieze by Rachel White Reed, who's a British artist and the first female to lead an exhibit at the uh, Tate Modern. Uh, this work, which is entitled U.S. Embassy Flat Pack House, is a concrete cast of a typical American suburban home from the 1950s extrapolated onto the wall there. Next slide. So the design of the U.S. Consulate General in Milan, that shop uh, that was featured in the video, really celebrates the materiality, I believe, of Italian architecture with this mix of modern and historic methods and materials. And the facade is this intricate framework of digitally processed and fabricated stone panels in this warm cream color, recalling the buildings at the historic center in the piazzas of Milan. Uh, this new office building, which is centered on this principal axis, really initiates a constant visual dialogue between the past and the present design elements to complete that promenade. Really has a respectful reflective walk through the site's history while also preserving the necessary security. Uh, the Liberty Building, which you see here, the two columns in the foreground establishes this principal axis through its portico and decorated steel gate. Uh, so in perpendicular to it, the new building the, and the pavilion is the nearby embankment. It really creates this axis that visitors can follow from the nearby piazza to the water features, really successfully integrating the camp campus seamlessly into the neighborhood. Next slide. So there's a series of gateways, pavilions, and gardens along the way that really humanize the scale of the spaces and offer moments to enjoy the landscape. And from an environmental standpoint, you know, this careful interplay of design engineering and the geothermal system, almost zero heating energy is going to be required. So the ground source heat system supplements this heating and cooling services, and this geothermal system, you know, coupled with photovoltaic cells, we believe we'll save about 43% of annual energy costs, which is exceeding our local energy efficiency requirements. And working in collaboration with the city of Milan, the result is a design that not only lowers energy costs and reduces greenhouse gas emissions, but also has resiliency strategies that advance the shared goals of the United States and Italy to really augment those renewable energy usage. You know, I believe uh, the overall effect is timeless, presenting a functional, efficient face that references the classical elements around it. And these are the kinds of discussions we had with the city of Bratislava about why us moving into their city is going to be a good collaboration between the two of us. Next slide. But the last example I want to show here quickly, Hyderabad, India. I think here's another example of a close collaboration with the city to not only ensure the public spaces in front of our building meet our security needs, but are also very inviting and welcoming. Uh, there's also a series of sacred stones on our site that we couldn't touch. So the design solution by Richard McKinney here weaves around those stones. Uh, the project also incorporates local woods, a jolly screen pattern that's found in Indian textiles onto the facade as a sustainable sunscreen element to reduce heat gain on that facade as well. Uh, next slide. Jason? All right, so um, so this is our case study in Bratislava. We'll talk about it for a second. Uh, Curtis and I were in Bratislava last week, uh, along with Kevin Rice of DSNR, and the ambassador asked us to come um, to meet with the mayor because, frankly, the mayor had some concerns and objections to our NEC. Um, our embassy effect pitch meeting went pretty well, right? It's a compelling story, uh, but. But candidly, you know, the mayor quickly gets to the point, right? He goes, I, I understand you're going to build a great building, but but ultimately I want more than that, right? I mean, what is this building going to look like on the edge, right? How are people going to interact with it? How is this thing going to fit in my city? And it's important because the mayor has the ability to block us, right? I mean, they mayors control zoning, they control planning approvals, they control building permits. We ultimately have to work with these cities uh, to have success. So our, our message was simple is, you know, let us partner with you. Uh, we have a world-class team uh, of architects, engineers, uh, you know, we can come up with a way to meet our goals and your goals. And, and the interesting thing about Bratislava is it's really a, a glimpse into the future of our program, right? We're gonna start moving into more and more developed markets. 
And we're going to have more and more of these conversations kind of as we go forward. So next slide. So this is a, a world map slide. I mean, we, we use world maps all the time and we put dots on them to, you know, to talk about um, some of the things that we're doing. This one is interesting because it talks a little bit about this future trend in our program. So you, you might think about our program in, in kind of three groups, right? The, the work that we've done, the work that we're doing now, and then this third wave, right? This next group of work that we're gonna be doing. And if you look at the map, what it shows, there are 28 dots here, right? This shows the next places that we're going to start looking for sites. And if you look at it, you realize this is an enormous cluster in Europe, Japan, Australia, Canada. In fact, I think it's 75% of it are in these kinds of markets. And we actually have another group of places we're likely to build new embassies. And guess what, right? They're all clustered in the same locations. So this is really, you know, as we talk about Bratislava, you know, this is really the beginning of what we're going to see, right? This wave of developed markets and how we might need to adjust our program to continue to be successful. So, so some of the things you'll see, one is smaller sites, right? Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to get the kind of site sizes we've been able to achieve, you know, in these developed markets. <clears throat> And if you have any doubt, right, just look at aerial photography of Madrid or Buenos Aires or any number of places. I mean, an entire city block, you know, even if we were able to achieve that, might not be big enough to do the things that we've traditionally done, right? And we've looked at all 30 of these markets, so it's going to be challenging. You know, one of the other things is think sites are going to be more expensive. Uh, we're going to have more active community groups. We're going to have tougher approvals. And we're going to have more conversations with mayors uh, and cities like we did in Bratislava. Uh, now, we can be successful in these markets. We, we have been in London and, and in Milan, um, but it's going to require close collaboration and, and you know, coming up with, with new approaches to be successful. So next slide. So, so let's jump right into it. This is our site in Bratislava. You can kind of see it you know, wedged right between the traditional city and all of this contemporary development. Um, you know, it's a perfect location. I, I honestly can't imagine us achieving a better location, you know, for the department that's going to serve us well for 50 plus years. So next slide. So in this slide, you kind of see it even better, right? You see the traditional European urban core on the left, all these red roofs. Uh, on the right, you see all of this commercial development. Um, to the right of our site, you know, we have a new national theater. To the south of our site, you have the Euroveo Mall, uh, which is just beautiful, right? Um, you know, you have, you know, fountains, great public spaces, you know, walkway along the river, restaurants, and very similar to kind of a, a, the DC, you know, the wharf in DC. But you take a look at our site. I mean, it's right in the center between these two things, and you can kind of understand the mayor's concerns. I mean, it's right in the center of his city. And and let me talk about the colors for a second, right? Because there's really two, two messages to, to make with respect to all of these colors on the site. One of them is this is not one parcel, right? I mean, you're not going to find five acres in the center of a European city with a Remax sign on it. I mean, that that, that just doesn't happen, right? I mean, this has been five years of work, it's six parcels, five sellers, thousands of hours to get ourselves in this position to be able to potentially acquire the site. And, and that's what getting great sites in Europe and other developed markets is going to be about. And we just have to kind of adjust our thinking about what the site phase is going to feel like and what it's going to require as we kind of move forward. And then the second thing, really to the point in Bratislava is, Guess who owns one of those colors? Well, the city of Bratislava does, right? So there we are back again talking about the city and the mayor. We need to acquire his parcel to make this whole thing work, right? We need to get his consent to move forward. So, so you know, before I'm going to pass to Curtis, just one last thing. You know, in the end, you know, we're not really presenting the answer to to, to how we're going to interface with these cities or, or necessarily be successful in Bratislava. But we are starting to frame the issue, right? 
this is something that we have to work together to achieve, right? You know, our partners in diplomatic security, you know, our partners in industry, and, and I'm fully confident, you know, we're going to come up with the answer. I mean, this is really the legacy of our program, right? We've been smart. We've overcome every challenge, right? We've built 100 buildings over 20 years. Right? So let me pass to Curtis and he maybe he'll talk a little more precisely about what the mayor was pressing us on. Thanks, Jason. Go to the next slide. So the mayor of Bratislava is an architect and he has written a large document plan Bratislava about the future urban planning of the city. And, you know, when we met with him, we spoke to him about how we handled security in urban centers, like in London, without our facility looking like a fortress, which was his concern. We talked about how we provided public space, like in Milan on our property, as a way to help activate streets that were previously overlooked. And if you look at this diagram, you know, when we walk the site, uh, it, we said there's a, what's missing right at this point is green space. You know, there's a very active waterfront along the edge. That's water off to the south of the photo with restaurants and, and drinking and bars all on the waterfront. Then there's this mall with very active internal shopping activity. We sort of explained to him that everything around there, the really backs of buildings facing our site. We thought it was a bunch of, we had four fronts to our site. Uh, we actually have the backs of all these buildings around us facing our site. We talked about the Zaha Hadid towers to the Northeast, how that is all about park space. What's really needed on this space is public park space. Next slide. So when we showed this diagram about how we actually believe we could still meet all of our requirements, meet our security requirements and give back to the public, his whole approach of this should be an active retail urban storefront with shopping up to the streets, his tune changed a little bit. And that really was the, the thing that tipped us over the edge. So I think to continue these conversations about them selling us this piece of property right in the middle of the city. Next slide. So when we show them our idea of how we felt like this, what the site needs is active park space and public engagement, because this is really a place where people are passing through on their way to this retail shopping that's very internal and to the water, which is where all the activity is actually happening, um, that the likelihood of there being really an active retail presence on our street was really um, not as feasible as maybe he perceived with the active highway street to the north, the tram system and the parking garage entrances on the south, uh, that really park space is really what it's been, which was helpful uh, to him to understand that we'd walked the streets, we'd understood how the urban context worked. And we believe that we have a, a, we're set up for success in terms of future dialogue with the mayor and the city. And we couldn't have done this without uh, Dela Scrippity on Renfro, who really was instrumental and that's not only showing that we had a partner with us that is going, that has a breadth of experience in dealing with how to activate streets with showing the projects like the High Line, the Shed and Lincoln Center Plaza, but that really, you know, we were gonna be partners with them that we brought them all the way to Bratislava to show that we're ready to start this dialogue. Thanks, Curtis. Thanks, Jason. Uh, what's really wonderful about what they've done here is really start to connect uh, our efforts uh, with that of the city. And as, as humble as Jason is, he's described their efforts in Bratislava as game changing. So we're really hopeful that this discussion that they have with the city is gonna move us forward in the right direction for that. And then another thing, a little fun fact about Jason, 10 years ago, he was the one that came up with the idea of the embassy effect. So I don't think a lot of people know that he should get credit for that. So let's go ahead and move to embassy 2050. Uh, what you've been seeing uh, at the beginning of our discussion with the industry advisors was a lot of the way the buildings look. And what Curtis and Jason were starting to describe is a, a lot of way the, the buildings start to function uh, technologically. And the reality is that these buildings are very performative, uh, te technologically advanced, and hyper flexible to adapt to a, a variety of sort of programmatic features. And so the reality is the world is in a constant state of change. And for OBO success to be successful and for the diplomatic platform to be resilient, uh, there's a need for us to be prepared for that change and to understand all the global drivers that are going to be impacting the built environment in the future. So uh, the team has put together another video for y'all, uh, so we'll have them turn that on now.
So what are the global drivers? The global drivers are population, urbanization, resources, climate, and then technology. And then the question after that is, you know, why are they important? The five global drivers are really impacting the way that OBO is approaching our portfolio, our strategies, and the way that we do business. We are either planning to build or are currently building in 18 of the top 20 global megacities where population is at the forefront of change. Uh, take a city like Lagos, for example, where the city is so populated and flooding has become rampant that now they're actually building out into the ocean. So there's a new 10 square mile development um, where they're dredging sand out from the ocean and using Dutch engineers to um, develop a new part of the city and that's where our next is going to go. The uh, population world's uh, changing drastically and growing exponentially. Um, today, we're trying to build a 50 year building out there. What's the population going to be look like 50 years from now in the city? And as those cities start to grow, it's going to change the kinds of demand that they have on the platform. And so the expectation is about 75% of that population is going to be in a city. They're going to be in a city near us. And how and why and where people choose to migrate is going to continue to impact the global drivers of population and urbanization and ultimately shape the way that we do diplomacy. So why is resources going to be a concern for us? Well, as we start to grow in the amount of people that we have on the planet, and those people start to migrate to cities, we're going to start wearing thin the resources for those particular folks, right? So how do we, as an organization, help? You know, what can we do? And a lot of the materials that we use are fairly um, intensive in terms of the energy they require to make. Concrete's been a, a primary driver of the structure of our buildings. Um, so maybe how can we look at other materials such as mass timber? Uh, we've looked at possibly nanoparticle technology for concrete. Let's try to think about different ways that we can deliver our projects in a more efficient way. And yep, sustainable. So being able to produce more and use less is critical to our ability to maintain operations in the harshest environment. It also allows us the opportunity to be really light on the resources of that particular country so that we can demonstrate to others what it means to be thoughtful and careful and wise about the resources that they can have. Uh, we have to think about beyond the sort of all the perimeters of the site that we're looking at and really thinking about the site that we're contemplating buying in the context of the entire region and how that would work with the impact of climate, or urbanization, or population growth. The pace of change today has continued to accelerate, and technology is a global driver because it's completely transforming the way that we work and the way that we do business all around the world. One thing that we're doing in our climate security and resilience program is trying to leverage that technology as best we can uh, towards this objective of having data-driven strategies really that help us to adapt our facilities. So BIM and robotics and automation technologies drive a whole new world of off-site manufacturing capabilities. And this impacts our projects because there's a potential to reduce overall construction timelines and improve sustainable sourcing for our portfolio. The future of OBO is going to be quite a bit different from its present. We're seated in a really unique position as the federal government and with the breadth of our portfolio to be able to make significant changes towards addressing solutions for these five global drivers.
I'm going to go ahead and jump on in. I wasn't sure if Angel was going to come back on. Um, anyway, uh, very excited about this embassy 2050 effort. Um, and Angel, if you want to jump right in, please do. I thought you were going to say something. Yeah, I'm on. Can you not hear me? Now we can. Oh, okay. Well, I was. I, what I was going to say was that uh, I wanted to provide a little uh, background to the to my portions of the video, and that was that the camera adds 10 pounds and that Kelly Dowd put three cameras on me. That's what I wanted to say. And then you jumped all over me on that one. So um, let me just do a quick little story about how we got to 2050 as an idea. And frankly, it came with a conversation with uh, with Jamie and Kim, uh, Kimberly, uh, you know, a couple years back and, and Kimberly flat out asked, you know, what does an embassy look like in 2050? And for an organization that had a six year plan, we certainly didn't have a 30 year plan. So, um, sorry about the camera. So, that's kind of what was the impetus for this MC 2050 conversation. And, you know, had conversations with Rick about, you know, what we need to do to start preparing ourselves. And, uh, Rick, I'll, I'll turn it over to you just to, to outline kind of where we are and what we've been doing. No, uh, thank you, Angel. Uh, as Angel said, very, very excited about this program. Um, as you guys can see from the presentation and the talks earlier today, um, our program is, is is quite large uh, in breadth and uh, the amount of work we do in projects. And, and we always kind of had our heads down working on projects, uh, which is important. Um, this, this program actually gives us a chance to kind of lift our heads up and look at what the world is, is becoming and how much has changed and, and is gonna change. Um, all of our challenge, we, we firmly believe that the uh, government needs to be in, and should be a leader in the industry on, on looking at uh, technology and, and advancements and in, in how to do work. Uh, we also know that we cannot and should not do it ourselves. We have to partner with industry and, and this gives us a chance to partner with academia better. So industry always kind of gave us that as angel mentioned that, you know, 4, 5, 6, look ahead years, look ahead. Um, this really gives us a chance to look over that horizon. If you look back, uh, you know, 2050 is kind of a, uh, you know, mid century, kind of a good target for us. Um, but we build our buildings for a 50 year, uh, threshold at least, and we'll probably be in those quite larger. You know, we talk about safe, secure, functional, and resilient buildings. Well, resilient is one robustness in in uh, withstanding uh, some of these changes, but also flexibility in making sure we can adapt to changes, especially with technology advancing uh, to help us there. I'm um, so very excited where this may be. Um, when we started looking at this, we talked to our industry partners uh, and tried to understand what engagement they had with academics. Uh, a lot of our uh, a lot of our industry partners uh, are also professors or have uh, uh, long-standing relationships with different universities. Um, as you can see, we've reached out to several on our screen there. We're working with uh, several more. Um, really, this effort right now, uh, you know, since it was uh, Crook and Sexton and Northwestern that kind of helped us uh, imagine this program, uh, they kind of have first shot to talk about it. And uh, we actually have them uh, working on a current uh, current study for us. Um, we we do think every every university that we partner with on these will probably bring their own their own skill set, their own innovation, their own uh, research that they're working on. We're excited about that. So we're gonna tailor each one to kind of their uh, specific strengths. Um, and with that, uh, happy to introduce, uh, you know, Jamie Cook from Crook and Sextant and uh, Professor Kimberly Gray from Northwestern. And we'll have a little discussion about uh, what they're doing for us on this. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much. And Angel, I feel your pain about the, you know, added weight of the camera. Um, so what I'm going to do is just provide you with a quick overview of, of our embassy 2050 project. It starts with this question. How do we design and operate embassies to be safe, secure, functional, and resilient in a rapidly changing climate? 1 that's changing at a rate that far exceeds most prediction. So there's no simple answer to this. And I, for 1, think that everything needs to change. The climate crisis is but one example of a much larger set of environmental injuries. Mitigating and adapting to these environmental changes combined with the course of technological disruption and progress and global demographic shifts require that the planning, design, construction, and operations of the embassy tomorrow will look nothing like that of today. So over the last year, a team of 11 academic experts in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Northwestern, in collaboration with architects at KSP, have tackled how these drivers promote innovations on two timescales, near term and longer term. And that longer term is, is mid-century 2050. So first we identify 
identify three key and linked characteristics that are common to the, all the systems we study. The first is carbon management. To achieve rapid and deep decarbonization, this must be addressed in all embassy activities, not just with respect to construction materials or energy systems. Smart systems that integrate or couple systems are key to managing carbon and achieving massive efficiencies. Locally tailored designs are another important strategy to safe, secure, functional, resilient embassies that will be able to perform robustly in the face of a rapidly changing climate. In other words, local tailoring is a strategy for adaptive design. So our Embassy 2050 study digs into current standards of innovation and then reaches out to this possible 30-year vision in eight systems. And I'm just going to go through quickly what those eight systems are and try to point out how these key characteristics of decarbonization, smart system coupling, and local tailoring plays out. So the first section is site select. The first section is site selection and stability. This focuses on risk mitigation and natural hazards management. There is a revolution unfolding in how we monitor stability and safety of sites based on remote sensing and then new models to analyze those data. As we all know, the past is no longer a predictor of the future. Our second section is structural design, which discusses the necessity of moving from prescriptive to performance-based design, especially if we want to employ new materials and automated construction techniques. This, is, this illustrates that inherent coupling between structural design, materials, and construction. And Jamie Cook is going to elaborate more on this. Materials is the third section. Carbon management is becoming more and more important in material selection and development. The nano modification of materials is a promising strategy for carbon management, allowing us to shift to more local materials that we can then make to meet or we can modify to meet performance criteria and reduce concrete use. The hefty carbon footprint of, car of concrete is motivating all kinds of innovations to develop green concrete or timber concrete uh, hybrid construction. But it's important to think about going beyond simply reducing the carbon footprint of concrete because we could accelerate that carbonation, that carbonation process, which would allow us to make concrete carbon negative. The four sections, automation and construction, a digital workflow is going to make design modifications nimble and efficient. We see lots of opportunities in robotics and large scale 3D printing. Mobility, of course, is going to become electrified and part of the energy network for both generation and storage. Our sixth section is building physics. And this is where we're explaining how, how to, treat, to achieve not only energy efficiency, but human comfort and well being. Buildings don't use energy, people do. So let's employ smart systems to tailor interior spaces for human productivity and comfort. The seventh chapter is energy and emissions efficiently. We need to rapidly and deeply decarbonize. No more diesel generators. The challenge here is not really harvesting energy from renewable sources, but it's energy storage and the management of intermittent sources. Finally, our eighth section is one water, which explains the innovations around this circular economy of water, meeting water demands with storm water and recycled water, using nature based treatment strategies integrated into restorative ecological landscape design to treat water with cascading energy and and aesthetic benefits, convert organic waste to energy and or energy storage illustrating this coupling between water and energy cycles. The final section of our study is to address change adoption. Technological elites alone are not going to inspire change. There has to be institutional readiness. Human behavior has to be nudged. Cultures have to accept um, the changes. Policy has to support them. Workforce has to be educated. There is an intricate network of connections that have to go into effect for the level of change we're describing to take place. So I'm going to turn it to Jamie now um, to discuss how these academic ideas about the future can be deployed and in the near term and, and then of course you know farther out. And as importantly, how do we commute 
communicate these ideas effectively to a really wide audience. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, so, yes, we, uh, we've had the great pleasure of working with Northwestern here over the last few months and getting a little peek into the state of the art when it comes to research for a lot of these topics. And um, two things I wanted to point out, we really approached it from the perspective of a designer working with OBO, having a history with that. Uh, in terms of uh, what are the what are the, some of the key takeaways uh, from a design perspective, and how do we begin to think about these things uh, relative to the work we're doing now, and how that might evolve here uh, in the near future? So one of the things that is a reoccurring theme that that runs throughout a lot of these topics that Kimberly mentioned is the idea that we are really going to have to move fairly rapidly from a prescriptive to more of a performative based. Uh, design and engineering uh, uh, way of operating uh, in terms of our codes, the requirements, all of that for these projects. And I think a lot of us have already experienced some of the limitations, even within the OBO work that we that we've done there. Um, and they're they're rightly so. They're there for a very good reason. But things like FEBR assemblies, anti-RAM assemblies, blast setback, all of those things um, are are quite prescriptive now. And uh, in the future. Those things are probably going to have to move more towards a performative based way of looking at them in order to, 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 to really affect change on the scale and on the timeline that we're talking about here. Um, the, you know, what we're really talking about is uh, allowing projects uh, to be more project and place specific and to, to kind of feed uh, and allow for innovations to happen on a much quicker and more rapid uh, basis there. Um, these will include certain, uh, you know, looking at new materials, adopting new materials, uh, things like advanced blast modeling, hybrid concrete timber frame uh, construction, 3D printing, all of that uh, are things that are on the horizon, but it really is a question of how do we allow those things to be adopted at a, at a different rate there. Um, so those are things that we're, we're looking at, we're focused on, um, and that we're interested in as from the coming from a design uh, perspective there. The other thing is really uh, designed for human comfort instead of for uniform building performance. And uh, so there was a, there's a particular section within the report that has really piqued our interest that have to do with coupled systems that are really focused on real-time feedback for individuals as well as combining those with building sensors. So um, the idea of comfort in a building is gonna become very personalized and will really have a, have a very a direct kind of feedback loop into how buildings operate. And so this is gonna be really relying upon AI for predictions for energy and comfort and all of that. Um, and then also those, there, uh, there's likely to have to be uh, pretty strong innovations when it comes to me mechanical distribution systems, uh, and it really could impact the overall size and performance of these mechanical systems there. So those are just two of a number of things that will have uh, uh, impacts here uh, when it comes to how we design these buildings um, and what the, what the design, the outcome for those designs might be there in the future. The other part that, that um, we, we're, we're really plugged into is how do you begin to communicate uh, NC 2050, uh, the report itself, but then even beyond that. And, um, you know, of course, we're, we're very interested in sort of uh, looking at how each one of these topics relate to and directly address issues of safety, security, functionality, resiliency, all of that. Um, but we're also aware that the audience for this could be quite broad from the congressional level through the general public and obviously the a &E community and OBO as well. So uh, the report itself we've looked at, um, it's primarily graphics based um, and it's really addressing uh, many reading speeds and allowing people to kind of get into the data uh, as deep as they need to or want to and yet still be able to really extract the information that they need. It's shaping out to be a fairly decent sized document, but we wanted to make it palatable and make sure that people are able to get into that and understand it on a, on a particular level. So a lot of our effort has been working with uh, Northwestern to figure out what is the best way to do that. Um, how do we really translate what in some cases are quite complicated ideas and concepts uh, into, into something that's digestible, that's easy to, to really understand there down the line. Um, hey, Jamie. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I saw Christy pop in. I think she's given us the hook. 
So okay. We okay. Want I'm, to I'm ready to wrap it up here. This is the last bit. Okay, so, so basically the bottom line is what we're trying to do is really lay the groundwork for um, additional, potentially additional ways of adding onto this report down the line. And so um, that's that's really kind of where we're at on, on that end. Thanks guys. I, I think Christy giving us the hook is, she should have given the hook to the last guys. Those are the one that ate up all the damn time. So yes. uh, I, I will say, you know, in closing of this section, I think what you're seeing is uh, you know, the impact of our work and the future of the platform is really based on the collaboration of, you know, academics, industry professionals, and government, which is exactly the way it should be. All of us sort of working together. And, and what I'm hopeful for is that, uh, you know, a lot of you guys that are in the audience uh, can see yourselves in the work that we're doing and the work that we're going to do, because that's that's what, what it's going to take to for us to be successful in the future. All right, Krista, you can take it over. Thanks so much, Angel. Um, and I also share the camera weight, but also mine adds an 80 year old marble red lifelong smoker to mine too. So, um, <laughs> uh, we are, um, we are getting ready for our break. I did want to just mention the videos and the presentation that we had. I hope that all of you that are listening in and those that work at OBO felt a great sense of pride about those portfolio projects that we showed um, and the forward leaning ideas and thoughts that Lauren Frank and John Pitts and Rick and Curtis and Angel shared in the video. Um, those projects are just amazing to see. And I know um, most of us don't even know half of what goes into the blood, sweat, and tears that you guys put together um, to have a, a presentation like that of, uh, we are so proud as an owner. Um, and I hope that those of you that are on also felt some sense of pride, regardless of how you're contributing to that. But um, can, can I add one comment about this? What'd you say? Can I just add one comment about this? You know, oh, and you know this, but maybe some of the others folks don't. Over the last 10 years, our buildings have been winning a whole bunch of architecture, engineering, and construction awards. I think the videos that you showed today suggest that we should be getting into film festivals pretty hard right now and seeing what we can do at cons or Sundance, because I, I think we have a shot. Maybe NYU will take us on for acting school so we could also <laughs> play the appropriate roles. Um, so I, I, we are a little bit behind in the schedule. Um, I do want to flag a few things. We're going to go on break. We're going to come back at 1120. So it's, it's about 1108 now. Um, so folks can go get a little bit of coffee or um, in addition to the virtual backgrounds for IAG, Uber Eats will be delivered on behalf. I'm just kidding. We, we can't do that. But um, I hope you can grab something for yourself because we have a really great afternoon lined up, exciting conversation about the executive order um, that, uh, that President Biden has put out on climate change and what OBO is doing with their partners, both on the academic side, um, as well as in our professional, um, with our professional contractors um, to do our part um, to uh, do good for the environment. Um, anyway, I want to mention OBO trivia. So during break, um, the external affairs team put together some of our favorite trivia over the past um, few months. So if you want to know a little more about OBO, that'll be running during the during the break. We also have Slido is pretty active right now. We've got a lot of good questions on there. If you haven't checked it out, please do um, let us know your comments and your thoughts, and we'll be sure to address that in our public input section. So. We will see you all back here in about seven minutes. All right.
Hey, everyone, just uh, a two minute warning before we're going to come back on and get started um, at about 1120. So um, thanks to everyone for playing trivia. It's uh, we've got a, a good little competition going on here. We'll, we'll, we'll announce the winner when we come back, but uh, we'll be on at about exactly at 1120. Hey guys, welcome back. We are um, getting ready to get started um, for our afternoon session. Thanks again to everybody uh, in the morning for participating. I know many of you were logging on Pacific time at like 5 a.m. Um, hopefully you're awake now with your coffee and ready to go for a roundtable executive order tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. Before we get underway, um, I just want to also thank those that participated in the trivia during break. Um, a few shout outs to uh, Kevin Anderson, Kurt Patterson, Graham Sim, Bruce Fadre, an old friend, um, Bruce McKinley, Whitney Voss. How you doing, Whitney? Um, and Adam Hurley for being one of our on the top leaderboard of responses for trivia. So you 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 win. You know OBO. Um, Angel, I'm going to turn it over to you um, to get us back on track with time um, and introduce our, our roundtable and executive order. This is actually the, the first time we are inviting our academic um, advisors to come join us with our peers. Um, I think, you know, the topic obviously warrants significant conversation. Um, and I think as Henry mentioned in the morning, um, the department right now is, is very focused and Rick is gonna talk a lot about um, our engagement with the department and responding to the executive order, but um, we're in the process of looking at budgets for FY23. So this conversation is very timely um, and will, and, and a lot of the contribution um, that you give us today um, will be a part of how we formulate our response um, and ask for the resources to do that. So I want to, um, Angel's Angel uh, Design, Rick and Curtis um, are going to be the OBO moderators for this session. We're glad to have Claire, Dan, Nat, and Stacy Smedley as part of our IG team. And academics are Anna Dyson um, from Yale, Christopher Boone from ASU, and Kimberly Gray from Northwestern. Angel, take it away. Uh, thanks, Christy. Uh, the executive order, I mean, Rick is going to walk us through the executive order. The reality is we've been working towards these kinds of efforts for multiple years and the executive orders to really kind of provide some markers and also helps, we hope, to really push us towards more resources to help get some of this stuff done. So if we had the next slide, I want to have uh, Rick sort of walk us through uh, what he's seeing there. Rick? Yeah, thank you, Angel. Um... So, so everybody knows a uh, you know, new executive order came out uh, this last spring talking about you know, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. 
Um, it, it's very uh, far reaching um, order. Um, I'm not going to go over all the details of it. I'm sure we got a smart audience here. I'm sure you guys have read it. Uh, if you're not, you can find it. Um, but pretty uh, aspirational goals for the for the government as a whole uh, to achieve uh, pushing towards net zero and electric vehicle fleet. Um, you know, carbon carbon pollution uh, um, savings, a lot to it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of behind the scenes what that's meant for us uh, in the department. Um, so as soon as the order came out, we we set up some uh, working groups throughout the department, and certainly OBO is a, a big player in this is with the uh, overseas portfolio. Um, but just so you guys realize, is also um, our domestic bureaus. We have domestic facilities that OBO does not oversee, and we have we partnered with them um, along with uh, procurement, uh, contracting, uh, policy uh, um, development. Um, Outreach for overseas uh, with our with our uh, partners overseas, um, diplomatic security. Uh, really, it was kind of far reaching across the department. And our first task was really to create uh, what we're calling the climate adaptation and resiliency plan. Um, that's fully developed now. Um, I'm not going to go into too many details. So I don't uh, preempt the secretary because that's never a good thing to do. Um, it's not published yet, but my understanding is going to be published very soon. Um, but it's a wide range far reaching plan across the department talking about how we're going to um, develop uh, an organization that can tackle this uh, executive order. And really kind of focused around issues like, um, you know, enhancing the uh, you know, mobility in the workforce, um, emergency action planning for our overseas posts and domestic facilities, um, supply chain management, um, improving local infrastructures with our partners, uh, you know, host country partners, and then uh, really kind of the OBO part mostly is uh, providing climate ready sites and facilities. Um, so that plan is coming out, uh, I believe any day now, um, you, you can, uh, it'll be publicly uh, um, out there where everybody can read it and see what we're doing. Next steps on that was really to uh, develop a sustainability plan. Um, so that's in the works right now going through approvals and that's really going to uh, um, outline mitigating the impact of climate uh, setting goals and uh, specific metrics on where we're going to go. Um, as Angel said, uh, you know, OBO, we're not caught flat footed on this. As these are issues we've been talking about for quite some time, uh, particularly on the energy and sustainability side. Uh, anybody in the industry knows sustainability has been a hot topic. Um, we've been working on that. Our, our buildings are, are, are meeting the standards uh, for LEED and uh, you know, ASHRAE and um, past executive orders. Um, so we're happy about that. Um, this new executive order, I think, will really help us uh, push further into uh, a better savings, better resiliency, um, and doing it for reasons uh, you know, not just because of the executive order, but because it's the right thing to do. Um, we need to, you know, safeguard taxpayer dollars, which is very important to us. Uh, these these embassies are are not cheap. We need to build them in the most effective way and the most efficient way. Um, we also need to uh, be good stewards of uh, the local local host countries' resources. It's, it's not a good look if we go in there and use up their water and use up their energy. So we need to be as efficient as we can there. And it's just the right thing to do. Um, on the climate side, a couple of years ago, we talked about it before, but we started up our climate security resiliency program. Um, and that's really kind of starting to collect data on these global drivers and all the climate changes out there so we can make better decisions going forward, not just in our building standards, um, but talking to uh, you know Jason Delar and his team that are buying sites, make sure we're buying sites that are in the best locations um for for a number of things uh not just seismic but uh you know flooding localized flooding tsunami drought air quality uh, many issues like that um so so with that i'll wrap it up and get into this discussion um i believe uh we got a robust discussion with our with our team here talking about uh carbon i do want to mention carbon that's one thing we have not really ever done in the department with obo um i think this executive order is going to help us uh, push towards that um, and help us get the resources to just just do more because it's the right thing to do. Hey, Rick, let me let me just uh, add a little context to what you're saying. You know, the, this this our efforts on climate crisis is a security issue, right? So uh, when we first started talking about it, what we recognized was that it, it's going to impact the way that we are able to operate, and uh, that if you guys know about Tyndall Air Force Base, they got hit by this hurricane and caused I don't know three or four billion dollars worth of damage. And uh, the DOD said that was the most impactful thing to happen to, to their operations than any attack in the Mideast. 
So our efforts here do a whole bunch of different things, but one of the other things it does primarily is to ensure that we can maintain operations in really kind of tough places under tough conditions. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So, so these are the areas of discussion that we're gonna have with all the, the really smart people. So Rick and I are gonna sit back and, and see if we can understand what they're talking about. Um, the, the first one's about the, the carbon footprint. And for those of you guys uh, that, that can't get a good glimpse of uh, Stacy Smedley, she's wearing a hat that says, ask me about carbon. So we are gonna ask you about carbon. Stacy, go ahead and, uh, and kick us off about this conversation. Great, thanks Angel. Um, so I am gonna do a little bit of a carbon 101, maybe a 102, um, and I'm gonna start with some science facts. So um, really, um, Starting with the IPCC report, the most recent uh, report published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, in August of this year, states that as atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide were higher in 2019 than at any other time in at least the past 2 million years. And it also tells us that even under their low greenhouse gas emission scenarios, where we're at the on the right track in terms of emissions reductions, which we're trying to work toward, the best estimate of global temperature rise by 2041 to 2061, I think where many of us on the call will still be around to see it, uh, is 1.6 to 1.7 degrees Celsius, which is above the preferred warming limit set in the Paris Climate Agreement. So what this new data is telling us is that the Earth is warming faster than we previously anticipated and that the carbon emissions um, must be reduced urgently to do what we can to slow this warming down. Um, it's important for all of us to have this in our minds uh, on this call because we also know that buildings account for at least 39% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So when we talk about um, these building related emissions, this 39% um, of the total breaks into two buckets. There's um, operational carbon and embodied carbon emissions. Operational carbon emissions are something that um, the industry has been looking at for quite some time now, I would say decades. Uh, I guess into the energy efficiency things that you've heard uh, be mentioned. These emissions include all emissions associated with operating a building. So the energy consumption of the lighting, mechanical systems, plug loads, et cetera. Um, and reducing these emissions is tied to making all of those building systems as efficient as possible while responding to local climate and site conditions, how you site the building to, to use less energy and maybe have more solar access. Uh, moving to cleaner sources of energy, and that's really decarbonizing the energy grid, the energy that we're consuming needs to come from clean sources. And then moving toward climate resiliency, which is looking at implementation of things like on-site renewable energy and battery storage, which has already been mentioned, I think, also. So that's what we talk about and when we talk about operational carbon emissions. We have the solutions, I think, that we need. It's just implementing them uh, and, and really doing that uh, at scale. Embodied carbon emissions, which is what's on my hat, um, are something the building industry is just beginning to broadly understand. And that's really accounting for all of the emissions associated with the materials we use to construct buildings. The extraction emissions of those raw ingredients, the transportation of those raw materials to a manufacturing facility and vehicles and trucks, and the manufacturing emissions of turning all of those raw materials into building products, things like concrete, steel, glazing assemblies, gypsum board, et cetera. Um, these are called product stage emissions for all those things I just mentioned and are typically the largest piece of embodied carbon emissions. Um, in fact, cement, iron and steel, just those 3 um, materials alone account for 38% of global manufacturing emissions. So, if you think about what we use to build our buildings, um, it's a big chunk of that pie. Embodied carbon also includes everything else beyond that. So the transportation of um, products to, to the construction site uh, and vehicles, the installation emissions of the construction equipment used on site, the replacement of materials during a building's life. How many times are you um, replacing the carpet or the roof or the other materials in the project and coming up with more emissions to replace them? During a building's um, uh, end of life, it's how we de deconstruct the building and how we uh, take those materials and what we do with them. So really thinking about how we can turn those materials that um, are being demolished into new materials and then minimize the need to go in and manufacture or extract uh, more raw ingredients. So that's the circular economy approach. So all of that's embodied carbon. Um, reducing these emissions is tied to a, a bunch of things during the design and construction phases. It's tied to prioritizing the reuse of buildings versus building new. If we can build less, um, we're reducing those embodied emissions of the product stage. We can optimize building design and just use less materials in terms of our structure and enclosure and the high impact um, components. 
Uh, we can decarbonize high impact materials like cement and steel that gets into all of the innovation that's happening around um, carbon capture at the cement kilns or um, hydrogen steel facilities like the hybrid facility in Europe. And that really ties to market demand and innovation. And then uh, we also need to prioritize the use of um, alternative materials like mass timber and bio-based options that can actually sequester and store carbon in our buildings, making them carbon sinks. Um, and then again, regional materials have been mentioned but that also is going to reduce transportation emissions and really focus on the local local economy. So all of that are um, all of those things are things that we need to do to look at both operational and body carbon. When we first started talking about this component of the, the presentation or panel, the subject line was operational versus embodied carbon. And we quickly changed that um, because the 2050 globally, each of these buckets of building emissions account for around half of the impacts. So it's really operational and embodied carbons together, and we must be looking at them both together. Uh, we have to work on addressing all building related emissions together to truly reduce emissions and related climate impacts urgently. Um, there's a role for all of us to play. Uh, I think owners are there like OBO to set the requirements and the targets and to kind of catalyze the action. Design and engineering firms and construction companies and specialty organizations like mine can do the work. Uh, and I think the members of the IHG represent that audience uh, and that group of workers. Um, and the good news is that we actually know where these emissions, emissions are today and all those wonky per percentages and statistics I gave you. Uh, we have the data to actually do the work and the math and the expertise is, is building. So it's truly time to just dig in and make actionable progress. And I think we're about to dig in um, with the next um, set of speakers. Christopher, um, can you, you know, we met you guys a, a while back too when we started having these initial conversations. Can you talk about the things that you're seeing in this field too? Yeah, let me start off by saying that I'm surrounded every day by about 77,000 people from a particular demographic called Gen Z. And so those are, people who were born after 1996. And when I talk to students uh, from that generation, they are rightly concerned about their future and they're rightly concerned about climate change. And this is backed up, uh, you may have seen the recent Pew Research Center poll that came out. And for more than 70% of Gen Z students, climate change is one of their primary concerns. So the reason I mention this is uh, we need also to think about the human capital that's coming forward uh, by 2050. So we have a new generation of people who are thinking of this not as a secondary or tertiary concern, but something that they want to contribute to. They want to be part of the solution and not the problem. And I think, Henry, in your new job at OBO, I think you're probably going to find that to attract and retain talent at OBO, demonstrating the leadership that, that OBO is taking in climate change, I think is going to be is going to be really important to making sure that you've got that human capital in place in order to carry out all the great uh, ideas that we've heard about this morning. Um, the second thing I wanna emphasize is that whether it's at an embassy or a university campus is the opportunity to use these spaces as learning opportunities, and this can be formal or informal. So we achieved our carbon neutrality goal six years early, scope one and scope two, um, one, because it's the right thing to get right thing to do. Uh, but secondly, because we graduate 20,000 students every year and when they come from an institution that demonstrates that they're willing to, uh, actually go through the activities that we talk about as being important, uh, that it, it makes it an authentic experience. Then we're creating a, uh, a, a cadre, an army of people who are going to go out and have a multiplier effect on thinking through how to develop these strategies, no matter what their career paths are. And I think with the embassies around the world, there's a great learning opportunity, the embassy effect. I love that term, by the way, with the embassy effect, there's an opportunity for informal learning for people who go into these spaces and, and understand the leadership position that OPO is taking. And certainly one of the things, given the 50 year timeline of buildings that we've heard about is that we need to take into account that the climate that we're experiencing now despite all the extremes that we're seeing, these are gonna become more commonplace. So how do we make sure that uh, OBO uh, and partners are thinking about, uh, one, how to adapt to the, that changing climate, it's, it's going to happen. But secondly, how do we put in place a series of mitigation strategies that includes not just the material components, but the mindsets, the, the human behavior, uh, and the willingness of new generations to actually do something about it, again, to be part of the solution and not the problem. 
So I'll give you one kind of concrete example here uh, at my own institution. We uh, have a leader in carbon capture technology. His name is Professor Klaus Lochner. He created something, it's a passive carbon capture technology. He calls it a mechanical tree. You can capture carbon at about a thousand times the rate of, of regular trees. So we actually are putting one of these on our campus next to a, a new building that's being created right now. It's going to, it's going to, you know, capture a tiny, tiny proportion of atmospheric carbon dioxide, but tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people are going to see that. And so OBO in his designs, being able to demonstrate these kinds of technologies around the world can get people thinking about and hopefully have spillover effects um, that will have the kind of aggregated impact that, that all of us need. You know, Chris, um, I'm gonna to volunteer today to come see that tree in December uh, in Tempe, because I think that might be the most appropriate thing for me. But, you know, what you were talking about was that, you know, helping to, sh you know, just create this awareness and our platforms are for the sort of, you know, sort of regular sort of diplomatic efforts, but they also have this opportunity for soft diplomacy where they are these sort of symbols and examples of the kinds of things that are important for the US government and, uh, you know, advancing these kinds of technologies and stuff like that. Uh, Anna, can you share a little bit about, you know, what you guys are doing at, at Yale, especially around uh, awareness? Anna might be taking a pass right now, so oh, there we go. Yeah, okay. sorry, that's <laughs> all right. That mutes I help. I'll turn on my video. I, I apologize. Yeah, well, so I think, and and thank you so much for having me here. I've been very inspired by um, the projects that were shown this morning, and just the incredible um, exchange of, of of knowledge, both um, of what we can do right now and 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 what's on the forefront. I think. Um, just to even reinforce um, what Stacy said about the interrelationships between, let's say, you know, the multiple phases of the built environment process, you know, embodied energy really starts to happen right in, in up here when we start to conceive of the buildings um, and not disassociating that, let's say, also with the operational phase in terms of, of, of decisions. And I think that what we're really looking at is how can we build computational frameworks that really um, uh, reveal and are very accessibly reveal to everybody exactly what's happening and the implications, the sort of fast forward or future implications of decisions, not just from the standpoint of existing technologies that are ready to go right now, but how we can build our buildings to be more sort of evolutionary or another way um, that's been mentioned is adaptive reuse. So uh, clearly a lot of the technologies that we have now today uh, for so-called on-site net zero or energy storage or other things, we're not really conceived um, with buildings in mind. And in buildings, we have to do so much more, for example, on a building envelope than just generate power. We've got to give views to the exterior. We've got to have beautiful daylight. We've got to have cool diffuse daylight. There's many, many things we might have to do. And of course, there's the big security question. I believe that a lot of what we're doing in the academy um, of really moving towards sort of multifunctional materials that can do many, many things, many handles on the energy, et cetera, uh, will allow us to, um, uh, in a sense, satisfy uh, a lot of the demands for, of course, a su sustainable non-toxic material, embodied energy, um, abundant earth materials, biomaterials, of course, Alan Organsky in the chat. Um, uh, I think he, he reinforced what was so important about moving many of the, the building types that you've shown just now. If, if, if we're eliminating the security question for a moment, could, could be largely bio-based materials. And we can put, for example, security measures um, of having to use, let's say, um, concrete and steel. We can move it into the interior of the building where it all of a sudden um, uh, moves from being a problem for maintenance energies at the exterior into possibly being a moderator and, and, and being something effective for lowering our energy consumption profile. So that's how, for example, even with existing building stock, we can adaptively re reuse buildings that may not have, may have used materials that are driving up maintenance energies, et cetera, and, and resheathing or adapting, evolving them um, with active surfaces that can do a lot with the energy. And I think, I just wanna um, end with the security question because I feel that the, the OBO is so well poised um, globally to set the agenda for this interrelationship between security and on-site resiliency. 
um, to, and not to think about it as an all or nothing thing that if we can have an exchange of energy with emerging materials that can guarantee at least the basic energy and water requirements, it doesn't have to be completely on set night net on set sorry on site net zero in order to start to work with these materials that partial um, uh, you know um, uh, partial contributions are really important. And if we're also really focusing on human beings rather than the, you know, and keeping their comfort rather than the building, we will drive dramatically down uh, the energy consumption profile of our systems by sort of, in a sense, localizing and really working very, coupling very tightly um, the requirement for the energy and the supply of the energy, something that we really don't yet do in, in buildings today. Yeah, and, um, you know, Kimberly, you had also talked about in the, in the 2050 section, you talked about, you know, designing uh, for humans. Can you give us a little bit more on that? Uh, so the, the human centered design. Yeah. So, so um, this is the work of 1 of my colleagues, um, Georgia Canazzo and. Her, the point of this, she's an expert in building physics is, is really to think about how we can design buildings more than just energy efficiency. So how can we, because oftentimes energy efficient buildings are buildings that are uncomfortable for everyone who is in them. And so, and so, and that I think looking at your portfolio becomes even more true because, you know, you're, we're, we're using American standards in various parts of the world and, and, and that climatic standard is just not shared. So, um, and just enormous technology that is out there that can allow us to customize individual space, optimize comfort, productivity, and you know operate the building in a much more efficient way. But the, the so there's that, and that's really all about smart systems, all right. And so, um, but it, it, there's also all of these coupling of, of systems. You know, the energy system can't be thought of as independent from the water system. Or the building materials, and so you know that that is that's going to be challenging. This massive coupling that is um, and kind of network design that we really have to do. Yeah, I, I think what we're seeing, especially with the embassy effect and some of the things that you guys are talking about here, is that we are part of this larger system, right? And that there are these things that we do that cause these impacts all over the place. And they could be for good, right? Which is kind of our goal. Uh, but if we're not focused on it, then you know we're going to be on the wrong path. And you know, and, and some of the things that you started to talk about are things I'd like to have Dan to start to kick off the sort of middle bit, this middle section that we had, which is about materials and methodology. So Dan, go ahead and get us kick started on that conversation. Um, <clears throat> let me just start by saying that um, as a as a structural engineer, um, my team and I are. Um, focus on this embodied, embodied carbon question, uh, primarily, of course, um, as opposed to the operational one. Um, and and Stacy, wow, well said. Um, that was a great introduction. Um, I, I would add one thing, and that is that in addition to alternative uh, materials, smart design, recycling, um, we think there's a role for large organizations like OBO. Uh, to incentivize builders to meet certain goals that we think could really, really make an impact. Uh, but let, let me return to the smart design question because a lot of what we focus on, and I think has a lot of promise, is in this shift from the pers uh, from prescriptive designs into performance design. And um, some of these things can be pretty simple, and they can yield a whole lot uh, in terms of 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 reducing the materials used in a project. Um, the, um, uh, and, and let me take span for just a, just a, a second. Um, and then I'll say a few words about some material options. Um, the, um, th there, uh, and we've all lived through at least a year and a half more than that now of working remotely and our views of office spaces and how we use them as changing. Um, uh, there has historically been kind of a strong move within organizations like OBO to have largely column free spaces. Um, I think that's the kind of simple criteria that could be evaluated that might yield real savings in in materials in a building if you um, if you if you think about changing uh, sort of the way space planning and structure interact with one, with one another and add a few columns, it'll definitely yield some savings. 
uh, on the material end, we're really excited about 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 wood. Um, we're we're really excited about uh, reuse of materials, um, and um, we're also uh, excited about uh, 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 depositing carbons into our structures in ways that have harvested it from the environment uh, and reducing material. And on the re reduction of material end of things. Um, uh, it, especially if combined with this, this, this issue of potentially reducing spans, we think that the use of void formers is a way to replace concrete with air and post tensioning is a way to significantly reduce the materials used in buildings. I would add one more thing. <clears throat> Steel as produced today, especially in the United States, is, uh, is a highly recycled product. Um, and um, I think that steel could play a bigger role in the in the state in state department's uh, portfolio of buildings than they have to date. Um, so, with those few thoughts, I'll turn it over to the next person. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that you were talking about there was, um, you know, that we can be in a because of how much work we do, and we're doing two and a half billion dollars every single year. We can be a, in a position to obviously do what we're doing well, but actually be a leader, right? And you know, setting a tone for what it means for government to be a part of these things, and and uh, you know, do things the right way, you know, in policy and and then the, those kinds of ways. Uh, Christopher, can you talk more about the, the other kinds of materials that you guys are looking at over in ASU? Yeah, and I actually want to go back to the point that Kimberly made on on really taking a systems perspective because I think that's fundamental. Too often we we chunk these out into separate sectors. Water doesn't talk to energy, doesn't talk to materials, uh, doesn't talk to my, my in my business the the education component. And I think in order for us to be really successful, we need to take an integrated systems perspective. Um, because, you know, we might be doing things with the very best of intentions, <clears throat> excuse me, in one sector, right? Thinking that we've got the solution, but it, it could actually be undermining the ability of those other components to actually be successful. So, uh, one of the things that, that we're doing in both in research, but also in the way that we educate our students, whether it's around, you know, life cycle analysis or true cost accounting or the, the work that we're doing in uh, carbon capture or, or looking at some of the adaptation strategies. As we continue to hammer the idea that we need to really, and I would encourage OBO to do the same thing, and it sounds to be moving in that direction, is to always maintain that really uh, strong systems perspective. And that's not just within the compound itself, but back to the idea of spillover, how it integrates into the locations where you are that are culturally sensitive, politically sensitive, uh, ecologically sensitive. <clears throat> and, and again, not, not just trying to do no harm, but really trying to move the conversation to the solution space. And how can we, we share those solutions? So I would say that 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 maintaining that systems perspective is absolutely fundamental. Yeah, that, that's huge for us too. We've been seeing a lot of value in making sure that we're just working better together. You know, the, I think the way that a lot of people did work in the past, and certainly we did too, was that there's a lot of just handing stuff over at some point without it all kind of sort of touching together. And we've done a must better job of connecting that sort of operation side at the end to the kinds of thoughts and thinking that we have to do in the beginning. And I'd seen sort of Stacy sort of nodding her head throughout your your sort of systems approach things. So I wanted to get her thoughts on that too. I do a lot of head nodding. Um, oh, no, I think, too. I, I think it's mostly because I'm not understanding. So I'm like, oh God, I gotta figure that out. I'm agreeing. No, I think it's um, you know, those of us that have been in this kind of sustainability and environment space um, for a while now. Because I've kind of seen these different aspects pop up and us get smarter and smarter on them. There's energy efficiency, there's water consumption, there's material health, there's embodied carbon, and there's kind of a a, a past hangover of us all having expertise in each of those things and, and focusing on them and coming up with a million different ways to approach each one. Um, and I think what's happening right now, what we're seeing is this opening up, even when it comes to building owners, talking to each other about the process for doing this stuff and wanting to share the same process and systems that they're um, approaching. Um, and it's vitally necessary because if we don't kind of democratize all of this data and expertise and bring it together, we may again have unintended consequences that we've heard about where doing a really efficient envelope with a bunch of triple glazing and all sorts of things is going to you know, ratchet up your embodied carbon emissions or um, some water systems going to have some other alternative impacts. So 
Um, I just am in agreement that's where things are headed. I think we're waking up to that based on um, lessons learned um, as we've moved through learning about all these different things. Um, and now it's just time, I think, to bring it all together and commit to that approach. Yeah, mute bar. Uh, yeah, it's the commitment piece, right? It's, you know, I think the first step is the conversation that we're having here. We got, we, we got to start making, you know, OBO, but certainly our consultants and contractors aware of the goals that we have. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that we're learning from a variety of y'all um, that is going to change the way that we do our work because it's, it, you know, it just can't be done the same way that it was before uh, for us to make a positive impact in the way that, you know, Christopher was talking. It, it's not enough not to do bad. Uh, it, it, we really do have to push to, to being a lot better and, and being, you know, a part of the group of people that are, are making a difference in the, in the positive kind of way. Um, and any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I just, um, I, 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 I do think that, that, that this issue of, of commitment is, is, is absolutely critical. And I think sometimes what happens, um, so alluded to this all or nothing, sometimes the targets stymie us, um, you know, in commitments because they, they could be unrealistic or they're one size fits all. I mean, obviously you're working in vastly different climates with vastly different resources um, uh, in terms of um, being able to reach, let's say, on-site net zero or being able to procure local materials or biomaterials or whatever the, the goals might be for your life cycle uh, and having a positive life cycle. And I, I just, I, I feel that we should like if there's um, one thing that we sort of leave with um, in terms of a difference between the way that we think of buildings now and the way that we need to start designing them is um, that we must think about them as uh, part of an ongoing sort of ad adaptation towards climate. And, and I think that that's the thing is that we, we saw some really, really beautiful buildings today. And then the question is probably in five years, we might actually be presenting our buildings, not just as the objects that they are, you know, when they're finished, but what is the sort of plan moving forward towards adaptation? So it's, it's, a, it's a major conceptual shift um, in also partnering maybe with research a little bit more um, fundamentally in the way that, you know, the built environment sector has unfortunately in our country not been, you know, well-funded, let's say, as a, as, as a kind of research sector. Um, and we couldn't even see it as a, as a sliver in the Department of Energy pie chart at some point. Um, uh, as, as, and, and, and just I think that the fact that it's such a massive contributor towards these things means that we really need to start to think about it like as a kind of new space race, it's the earth race, it's where we are on earth. And we really have to think about our buildings on a continuum and not as fixed objects that we were delivering and then saying, great job. Yeah, I mean, we are we are definitely part of a big system here. And Alan in the chat had put in a question about, or a comment about, you know, uh, reforestation, you know, if we're starting to use more wood and those kinds of things. We don't have an example of that specifically, but like I know, I happen to know in, in New Delhi, um, it's, it's got some really terrible air there, and you know everybody's sort of mowing all that stuff down. And, and part of our commitment to being in the city was replanting a whole bunch of trees on site and off to to help help the city. Now that's a really kind of small little thing. Uh, you know, one of the con one of the conversations we're going to have later on is really about how do we look at this at a sort of portfolio level versus a project level. So. For that particular project, we will do some things, but if we could start to do these things, we have 290 locations, right? So just about this particular topic, we can make a big difference across that program, both in the way that we do our work, but also in the way that we talk about the opportunities for those particular cities and those countries to contribute to the successful conversations that we're having about those specific kinds of things. It, what we're experiencing in OBO is that there is really big opportunities beyond just doing the, the building. The building now feels like a little small effort compared to all the sort of broader opportunities that are available us to, to impact. And it's, it's pretty amazing. It's folks like y'all that are helping us to understand that and understand what our role really is in that system and the way that everybody's describing, because it's not as, we're not just doing buildings, right? That we're doing or impacting all these other kinds of things too. Um, Kimberly, I wanted to turn it over to you. There are some things that you had highlighted in the in the section for MC twenty fifty that you were working towards. I just don't remember all eight. I'm sure one of these folks do, but I don't. So, is there is one of those specific eight that are, are one of the ones that you think are probably more closely aligned to to this uh, conversation? 
Um, oh, absolutely. So, so I guess I want to follow up on just a couple of things that, that people said. Rapid and deep decarbonization is really the holy grail. Okay, and so it, it doesn't just mean you know, quit th that we quit burning fo fossil fuels. Um, and when we talk about net zero, it, it's got to be that we reduce emissions. It isn't just that we buy offsets or we you know plant trees. And planting trees is really important. So I love when Chris gave that example of the mechanical tree that sucked in carbon because the real challenge I think now. Is, is going carbon negative, developing both behaviors and strategies and technologies that can remove carbon from the air. We need to remove 600 gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere. We need to quit putting it up there. There's, you know, we, we do know how to do that if we decided we wanted to, but we don't know exactly how we're going to remove the 600 gigatons that we need to remove if we want to try to keep warming to this what we think might be a manageable level of 1.5 degrees um, centigrade over pre-industrial times. So, so if you look at concrete, you know, why is concrete the most used material around the world? Because it's flexible and it's, it's strong and it's really cheap. And so we have to change that accounting that we need to, we need to attach a price to it that reflects its full cost. And there are just so many opportunities out there and you, it is possible, at least from a chemistry point of view, and since I'm a chemist, I, I really embrace this, to make concrete carbon negative. So we need to start, I mean, we have to, we have to think about rapid and deep decarbonization. There's a, there's a huge portfolio of activities, but it's beyond net zero carbon. It needs to be negative carbon, and it's amazing the things we can do, both in technologies and materials and behavior. To be to achieve that, that at least from an academic point of view, is is the challenge uh, of the future. I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to Claire Weiss uh, from WXY here, and uh, she recently won one of our support services IDIQs, and it's it's these contracts that are set up to help us do exactly what we're talking about here. How do you take the kinds of things that we're learning from y'all and start to figure out how to start to move the program in that kind of way? And so, Claire, I, I know that you're just getting into the program and, and and hearing a lot of things that we're aspiring to do. But I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, what you're seeing WXY's contribution in the space will be. Um, Angel, thank you. And also, it was really exciting to uh, be part of the panel to hear what Kimberly and all the and the other other academics were up to because they're kind of talking about this synthetic. Uh, way of looking at OBO as, in a way, a conductor of many systems. And so I, I always like music analogies, but uh, quite seriously, when we think about buildings, we have to think about how people move there. Like, how do you get there? How does everyone get there? Not only as static things, right? So when another, you know, I posted this on Slido, but it seems to so many people who are talking about new materials, biophilic, how you grow it, that when you look at the potential of OBO to have district planning, country planning, the possibility of looking at sites differently, all of a sudden you go, yeah, transit. Transit is a system that actually could use rapid decarbonization, uh, but also has huge impacts on people's lives. So if for all of us, I think we know uh, it's hard enough to change our own behavior in terms of how we design things, but I think it makes architects and planners, especially sensitive to how hard it is to instigate changed behavior, but that the built environment gives people a lot of clues. When you see buildings built out of different materials, you say to yourself, where do those materials come from? So I am also excited about um, this idea, Angel, I know uh, you, people have been talking to you about this, about <clears throat> ethics, you know, ethical supply chains of taking what's already happening in the federal government about, uh, about looking at, at labor as part of resiliency, adaptability, and sustainability, but also, most importantly, it's the decarbonization strategy. So I think that's 
where I would go with that. Claire, you're giving away a little secret of ours. Okay, yes, I, it's true. <laughs> so, so uh, Claire and I were in a meeting uh, a couple of days ago uh, with Grace Farms, and there's some real opportunities. It's essentially what we've been talking about consistently that we're a part of a broader system. And that system includes not only the things that these folks are talking about, but a whole variety of other things for which we need to be aware uh, and, and need to make sure that we're taking action on. And, and Claire, what I really like that you kind of hit on uh, was the sort of planning aspect. So Jason Delar and myself both used to run the planning office here. And, you know, one of the things that have changed was the way that we look at the work. And it was initially very, very focused on a post. What is that post doing? And, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. And then it was really kind of pulling that scale up a bit to understand how it's doing in the city and now, you know, how it's doing in the country. Like, how are those missions kind of interacting with each other in a country? -wide? And that was the sort of country planning thing that you were talking about. Yeah. And it sort of moves us into this sort of conversation about, you know, how do we take the kinds of thinking that you've been doing here and sharing with us and start to consider it at that sort of project level and that portfolio level? So I was going to turn it over to Nat to start to kick off that portion of it before uh, Christy gives us the hook. Yeah, I appreciate that, Angel. Um, and it, look, it's 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 this exact. I mean, I would start by that idea of the universality and OBO's role in all of this because it's it's actually especially gratifying that OBO invited two structural engineers to a sustainability and resiliency discussion, uh, which rarely happens, but it shows the the impact well, of the carbon. You guys footprint. were the only ones that said yes, so that's why you're here. here. You go. Dan and I often say yes, um, but I think in all seriousness. You know, we all are committed to a lot of these things and and it, but it's on a platform like this, to your point of a larger platform where, you know, Dan and I are very friendly competitors, but all these different firms that might be at different sides of the table in the private industry are able to really come together and think about how we can improve processes through the larger lens of all the projects and processes that allow us to develop over the larger, but then focus on the local when we get there. So it's not about, Dan brought up performance versus prescriptive. Um, we, we're in full agreement there. And I think that idea of performance-based designs where we really think about what the outcomes are we want, but then we can, we can marry them to very specific requirements on a site. And it's only with entities like OBO that we get that opportunity, I think, to really make big changes and big leaps in the process. I mean, one of the, one of the funny things, We've often discussed, I, I think the whole industry in general um, devalues ourselves. You know, there, there are quantitative analysts at hedge funds that makes billions of dollars on a couple of formulas, and we celebrate if we can run a duck through a beam. So I, I believe that we have the, the smarts within our industry at this point, and we always have, but, but we have the tools now to do this sort of real time integration and measuring of carbon footprint of embodied energy that equals the the operational um, energy in measurement of a building and really allow us to both again universally look at base studies and ideas of spans as Dan brought up and think about the way we build these buildings in general and then apply those on a building and project by project basis that comes back to benchmarks that are really truly measured and no longer about general ideas or or the thought that maybe we should reduce concrete a bit, but really measure what we're doing on the projects, project by project, and then feed back into a larger understanding of how successful we were. And I would, I mean, I would just end with a couple of thoughts is, I don't think this is, I also wanna say that I think that this is not simply a conversation because of a new administration and new initiative. This has continued to evolve in my lifetime of my career. And what I'm seeing now among embodied energy in the area that we really are focused with along with Dan's firm and others is that a common language is finally developing in a way that that we can really speak to each other across academia and to practice and to industry private and public um, in ways that allow us to really think about things uh, on one platform rather you know it, it was for a long time I would pull one resource Dan might pull another we might have a different measuring stick um, but what we're seeing now is just more and more con sort of uh, agreement and 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 the ability to speak across uh, both geographic boundaries and industry boundaries to really come to a common understanding of what we're after. So it's it is an incredibly exciting time, not just because of certain initiatives, but be, because of the tools we now have to, to to focus in on local and pull back on global and really understand the impact. Yeah, I, I'm going to ask uh, 
sort of added a jump in here, but when we were preparing for this conversation, all of these things, you know, it, especially for lay people, it seems kind of abstract. Like, they, they, how's it? Why is this really kind of a big deal? And what you realize is all the work that we're doing, all the stuff in MC twenty fifty, and all the things that are happening in the embassy effect, are for people. It's all about how these things will impact us. And that's what's so great about it, that you can connect all these things to the ways that, that, that they'll, they'll really better serve us as people. But Anna, I want to get your thoughts on, on what uh, Nat had just opened with. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, Nat just brought up a really critical thing, which is literally measurement. And the fact, even just, we still have, for example, models where we could pull the same material. We can get different um, measurements from, from consultants. Uh, especially engineer, um, energy modelers, et cetera. And so, um, and, and then these, these sort of, this data or the impact of our decisions is really still quite opaque in a lot of our models to so many of the stakeholders in the built environment process. And so I think we, we haven't talked that much about data and data visualization today, but one of the most important things in, 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 in our work is trying to build, uh, not just for built environment process, but we also work, uh, for example, with UNAP on the World Environment Situation Room, which is to try to get a single portal uh, for experts and non-experts alike to be able to query uh, data and impacts and future, you know, um, conditions, and maybe even just different, the, you know, the implications of different decision making and really make that more, more accessible for diff, for multiple stakeholders. It sounds a little bit scary because I think already we feel, oh my goodness, there's too many cooks and it's so complex and we have so many uh, documents and drawings when, um, when we come together uh, to, to, to build something like as complex as an embassy, for example, but at the same time, I think that the sort of jig is up as well um, in terms of the fact that this information and the implications of our decisions are becoming more increasingly clear, obviously, with big mechanism processes and other ways of making data and, and, and interrelationships between systems and behaviors across the life cycle. It's all becoming more and more accessible uh, as time goes on. And, and, and I think there will be a Moore's law in re relationship to that. I think we'll have more, more and better data. But the most important thing that we need is not just the data, but the meaning around the data, the, a way to discuss it, a way to explain it and, and talk about it. Actually, I think, and I think the pandemic was a perfect example of how important uh, in this day and age of the complexity of decision making uh, that is very, very important that in real time, uh, we have models for sharing data in, um, in, in understandable, digestible ways across different stakeholders, but also um, ways for experts across all these different systems. I mean, it's fun to say, let's get materials and energy systems, everything across the life cycle, and let's integrate it all. But that, that is really still a huge, huge uh, research and development challenge. We must say that like we're, we're, we're getting there and, and we're so much better than where we were, let's say 20 years ago, but it's an ongoing process. And I think this issue of data and information and the massive sort of glut of misinformation, even in our field, uh, really has to be kind of addressed and, and really um, it has to be brought to the forefront of, of what we're doing. And I like, I like what you're talking about there with, with, with data. And I'm not sure if it's data or data, so I'm gonna say data. Um, is that um, I say data and you say data. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but let's call the whole thing off. Even even only a few years ago, um, if you look at all, we have OBO's got about 600 projects ongoing at any one time, and the common thing that you could measure across all of them, actually the only thing you could measure across all of them, was money. Just <laughs> so how much you spent on it, but not almost everything else was you know some people did this, some people did that. And we're moving towards this, as you'll, I think you may have heard a long time ago, some efforts that we're doing around uh, data and a whole bunch of things and technology wise. Um, but it is the only way that we're going to be able to improve the work that we do is to measure things that are important to us. And if we're not measuring these kinds of things, then we're going to be missing the boat on a whole lot of opportunities uh, because we just don't know. And I, I see, actually, I was going to close with you, Christopher, because I know that I'm getting the hook. I'm getting text left and right. Let's say it very quickly. Let's collect money and carbon. Let's put a tax on carbon and then you'll start to see people do the right thing. This is a guy that has global futures in his title, by the way. <laughs> so, Christy, I think we're right at our mark ish. Um, anything else that you want us to make sure that we discuss? Absolutely. We've got some questions that came in. Um, we have a yeah. whole. Christy, Christy, real quick. I saw some of the questions came in. 
I'm not prepared to answer those questions, but these guys are. So I'm that's glad that why, you, that's why we, we that's why we let you smile and moderate, and then we yeah, got people to answer the question. Thank you. I don't think that's true. I think you can answer these questions. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, I just want to say we have we've got a really lively um, conversation going in both in the chat and Slido. So we're right now, you know, just trying to pull all these together thematically. Um, so um, I've got a couple questions that we pulled out. We do have an entire thirty minutes for industry and public input. So a plug for those of you that are on that haven't got your question in, get those in now because we're organizing that time. But I did want to I did pull a few out that were really specific to what you guys are talking about right now. Um, and I do want to invite Alan to come on with his camera because he's been putting some really insightful comments and thoughts and I'm going to say them, but I think it might even be better if we hear them from him directly. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to put the, a few of them out there, but then those of you that respond, um, I welcome you to have a conversation with Alan because he's got some really thoughtful um, both comments and questions. Okay, so um, Angel, the first one is since over 50% of carbon emissions from buildings will come from embodied carbon in the next 10 years, what are your current efforts to make reductions in this sector of emissions? I thought you were going to so ask I think this is when you say Rick. I think when this is when you go Rick. Yeah. This is, yeah. See, I've been giving these guys softballs and you're giving me this one. Um, I'll, I'll start off a little bit and then I'll turn it over to Rick. But um, there is a recognition on our part is, is that there is, we, yeah, thank you, is that there's things that we can be doing uh, to help out in this arena. And so we are, as part of our Embassy 2050 efforts, uh, to, to look beyond the way that we solve problems today, we are looking at a variety of different kinds of materials to, to help do that. And it ain't easy. Right, so the government gets used to delivering a product in a certain kind of way, and we know that it works. Um, it's hard for us to move off of that, but we are we're looking at mass timber and and um, some other things. Uh, but what part of what that process is is, is to really get uh, our technical folks and our security folks acclimated to what the opportunity is. You know, you, you talk to mass timber to somebody that doesn't really understand what you're talking about. They're like, you want to build a building out of wood. Uh, but, you know, you dive a little bit deeper and share a little bit more information. Uh, then there's an understanding of what the possibilities are that DOD has really kind of investigated its blast, its fire and all this other stuff. And so there's a real potential for us. And it doesn't have to be this wholesale change, but it could be uh, like a whole lot of things in our work, maybe a hybridized version of that kind of structural system. But I, I will turn it over to, to Rick and hopefully he'll have more uh, detail on that. And certainly I'd all of it up to the, the other folks on the panel because th that's kind of what they were talking about. It was different kinds of materials that can help us in this situation. But Rick? Yeah, Angel, that's a very good question. It's something we've been thinking about and looking at quite a bit. Um, you know, as Angel mentioned, the, the cross laminated timber, mass timber, rammed earth, uh, certainly more steel we've talked about or thinking about. And, and a lot of these issues of, or ideas have come from our partners, our industry partners, um, and pushing us in the right way. Um, part of all these efforts is really to kind of, you know, point us in the right direction so we can start developing standards around it. As Angel mentioned, uh, you know, security is why we do this largely, why we get our funding. Uh, we have to make sure diplomatic security is comfortable with what we're doing. And part of that is is just that, making sure they, they withstand blast pressures and, and uh, force entry ballistic resistance. Um, and then beyond that, it's, uh, it's not just a design effort. We have to work with our construction uh, folks and make sure they can build it, our maintenance folks, if it's a, a maintainability issue that we can maintain it down the road. And then sourcing materials and all those things. It's a, it's a big puzzle that we get to uh, try to put together. And uh, we've, we've made a lot of starts on it. We still got a ways to go to really get where we need to be. Can I just yeah, say thing, Angel? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to say one of the things about calculating your reduction is you have to know what you're reducing from. And one of the first things we're trying to get a handle on is what is our baseline of carbon emissions? How many trees do we have in our portfolio across 290 sites around the globe right now? So trying to figure out how to and, and fund sort of gathering the data on data, not data, uh, on what the baseline is first and foremost is I think the first challenge. And once we have that, then we can start to calculate what the reductions actually are. Yeah, so I mean, a lot, a lot of what we're doing in this particular space is, is working with industry folks and academic folks to understand what those operatives are studying them for its use outside of project schedules so that we really get a sense from both the OBO technical folks and the DS uh, folks to understand our comfort level within it. And, and once we sort of certify that we're good with it, then we would start to move that in into projects and start to have these opportunities to sort of pilot these things in a certain kind of way. So that's, that's kind of what we're doing in that arena. 
Um, thanks so much, Angel and Rick. Uh, I, I've got another one, I think, really good. There's some really hard hitting questions. So, um, super. Okay. Um, as a putative environmental exemplar of best practices in sustainable building that reflects even, even guides current climate policy, how does OBO design criteria promote environmental impact reduction across the building life cycle rather than just focusing on operational stage efficiencies? Yeah, the, I think I said all the words right. Yeah, this is going to have to explain that. Yeah, this is why I love having Rick around because this is I just I, Rick and then and then he goes he does this thing and then he'll turn it over to Curtis. But I, I will say real quickly that that's actually what we're working on now is we're evolving our standards actually in the same ways that uh, both Stacy and Kimberly started talking about it. Start to move this in a sort of a performative approach in the way that we are, we're developing our standards and our standards have been around or something like it have been around since like the '60s. And so we're constantly evolving them so that they're more performative in nature. And part of what we are recognizing for ourselves today is that it's it's not about that 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 single stage of doing the building, but it has this sort of whole uh, life cycle to it. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Rick to see if he can fumble a better answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll tap dance a little bit on this. One. That's a tough one. Um, you know, our, our programs uh, have grown and and matured over the years, right? Angel, I talk about this a lot. Uh, um, we're continuing to get better and we're not where we need to be on any of this. Um, um, we're doing better on the energy side, carbon, like I said, it's a, it's a brand new thing for us to really try to do in a real way. Um, environmental impact reduction, um, like I said, we're just getting there. We're, we got our climate security resiliency program where we're really working on collecting the data. Uh, you know, as, as Curtis mentioned, uh, um, collecting the data is one thing that we've just never really done and we need to do that so we can measure what we're doing and know that we're improving. Um, we got a ways to go, and that's why we're having these discussions. We're learning as we go. Uh, I think the industry is learning as we go. Um, I think we do realize that with our program, the funding we get in our program, the breadth of our program, and the, the worldwide footprint, uh, we can make a big impact on this. And I think that's what we're trying to do. Um, we're not there yet. You know, Rick, one of the things, this is actually for Alan. Um, Rick is the guy that actually produces the standard. So you and him are going to have a big, long conversation here after this meeting uh, about what you're you're looking to do here. Uh, but the, I'm going to hit a little bit on what Curtis was saying, which was, you know, starting to collect that data about what our expectations are. And so there are things that our facility group is actually working on these facility performance evaluations that we have these expectations based on our criteria that these buildings are going to meet these certain whatever it is, especially around performance and functionality. And then this this effort is really to understand, you know, after commissioning, is this building performing the way that we think so that we can make adjustments to the standards later on if, if these buildings aren't doing what we're expecting to do. But that, that's exactly kind of where we want to be in this. Um, what you're hearing with all these conversations with the industry advisors and the academics is the beginnings of where we are heading. And, and so that's really kind of what's Rick's charges with all the architects and engineers is that we need to start moving the needle on the way that we talk about the work that we want to produce and the kinds of impacts they want to make. Angel brought up a great point, that feedback loop on on what we do. We're, we're, we're unique also because we don't just, uh, you know, buy the land and, and design and, and construct these buildings. We own them and maintain them, right? And uh, our feedback loop on lessons learned and measuring what we've built and how it's operating has not worked. Uh, we got some programs to get there. Um, like I said, we're still we're still working on it. I, I think what I'm hearing is we need a round table on design criteria. I, I think we need a round table this afternoon is what it sounds like. Yeah, I know. I think it's great. Actually, I'll, I'll say add one thing, uh, Christy, you know, our last facilities uh, director had a really great change of the OBO acronym because OBO stands for uh, Overseas Buildings Operations and the way that he always described it was owner, builder, operator, uh, but it helps to reinforce uh, what our real role is in the organization. I actually ask people that work for us, uh, you know, I ask them what they do. And if they don't say I'm responsible for providing a diplomatic platform, that's a fail, right? So a lot of folks will say, well, I develop an RFP or I do design reviews. I'm like, nope, you have one job here is to provide a platform. And what we're going to start adding to that is that platform has to do da, 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 in terms of all these sort of performative metrics that we're going to start to identify for ourselves. Yeah. No, it's right. It's that it's the full circle. All of us. Yeah, we're all responsible for that. All of us, you know, and. Uh, obviously, it's, it's definitely our charge, but we work with everybody that's on the call here to make sure that stuff happens. And All one right. of the things that we've done is get our facilities maintenance teams that are going to be maintaining these buildings. 
actually making them participate in the design reviews during the design phase. And so that's been really helpful because when we start looking at different materialities and different considerations for how sites are organized, our facility seems a way in really early to help influence the final outcome. That's a good point, Chris. All right. Are you ready for the next question? No. Well, it's coming. So, all right. All right. How, how do the assessment of manufacturing, transport, and other embodied emissions and energy consumption, the potential of bio-based material assemblies for carbon storage, extraction impacts to ecosystems, and regenerative management of source landscapes figure as design criteria beyond LEED? First off, I want to say I'm glad I'm not taking any of Alan's classes right now because I would not do well. I mean, I barely graduated college, and that question alone would set me back multiple years. Um, I don't really have a wonderful answer for you on, on these kind, on this very specific kind of thing, but I will tell you that lead is is just a marker, right? That there are a lot of things we want to put, a lot of demands that we want to put on the building that aren't a part of lead. And what we've seen in in the past, and not in, not in the future, not, not recently, has been you know people chasing points. Uh, Rick, I'm going to turn it over to you because you, I know that's near and dear to you. What's important for us is that these buildings perform in the way that we want. And, and part of what we're learning is that we might be a little too narrow minded in the way that we think about how these buildings should perform. And so these conversations that we're having is are helping to flesh out what our expectations are for the building. But I'll turn it over to you, Rick. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, you know, Angel for keep dumping these on me. I, I really want to thank Alan for these questions. I think he knows the answers before he asks them. Uh, <laughs> and I think he's purposely putting us on the spot. Um, you know, I, again, uh, this is a lot of new stuff for us. Um, we want to do the right thing. We're working towards doing the right thing. Uh, we got a big program that's uh, unfortunately bureaucratic at times. And uh, it's it's uh, change management is a big thing for us. Uh, um, we've got to get it right for a lot of uh, a lot of stakeholders. It's not just uh, you know, it's not just State Department. We have other government agencies that have a say in how we do things. Uh, we got to make sure we can design it, build it, and maintain it. Um, and and often those are uh, competing interests and and in very difficult places. You've seen some of our portfolio. Um, there's a question on here on Juba that kind of got skipped. I think uh, maybe we'll come back to it. But you know, perfect example. If people don't know anything about Juba, you know, we we talked about it earlier. It's you know, we got a project going on there. One of the uh, you know, newest capital in the world. It is uh, as good as you could get. Yeah, there's no good. electrical grid to tie into. There's there's very, very limited water sources. We're gonna be running on generators 24 seven. We're gonna, we're gonna offset that with as much PV as we can. Um, but designing it has proven to be a huge challenge to try to meet all of our competing interests between security and uh, environmental stewardship and uh, uh, cost and everything else. Um, but then even more important, once we design this thing, we got to build in a place that's, that's very tough to get materials into and then maintain it in a place where the local labor market's, uh, fairly non-existent as far as any know-how and how to do things. Um, the plan right now is, you know, we're going to be trucking in a lot of water and fuel, uh, and, and trucking away waste. Uh, we're trying to limit that with our design as best we can, but then bringing in, uh, um, you know, design mitigations to limit that, right? So um, it's it's a very challenging portfolio. And I think questions like this is helping us develop a better path forward, but uh, it's not happening overnight. So hey, Rick, you know, Jerry Lee's gonna come to our our uh, our help here. No, uh, good. She, she'd, had, she, she'd offered to help answer some of the questions. In fact, I think we're gonna start asking uh, Alan to answer some of these questions for us too, but uh, <laughs> uh, Jerry Lee, uh, your thoughts? I'm hoping that my audio is working now. I yeah. can you hear me okay. Awesome. Um, well, I'm Darley Anderson. I'm the CEO of Green Roads International. Um, and I will mention that there are tons of opportunities in horizontal infrastructure in all of these areas. And there's a lot of overlap with that system level thinking as well. So I think there's quite a few opportunities. I'm particularly excited about it as a brand new um, IAG member. I am absolutely still learning on what that opportunity might look like for me personally, but I'd be uh, more than happy to speak with folks about uh, what those ideas will be and uh, looking at rating systems in general as a, a way to incentivize uh, thinking in the right direction for decarbonization, for um, all sustainability, the water cycle, all of those things that um, 
will let us actually do a little bit better, but um, thinking holistically will will definitely get us there. I heard a lot of things that the, this is my very first meeting, so I'm very excited to see sort of what where where I can add and um, and help and uh, make a contribution on that side of things as the token okay. infrastructure junkie. Yeah. <laughs> so, you have, you have to, you're going to have to sign up, Geralee, for the roundtable that we're having this afternoon because she's already. I will running. absolutely do that. Yep. And then um, I, I did want to let me just jump in real quick. Let me let me ask Alan to to give us his thoughts on, you know, he, I have you, one more question from Alan though before you do that. I'm going to round <laughs> out. I'm going to round out his submissions and then we're going to bring him on. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I do want to tell Rick we didn't skip Juba. We were just going to do Juba and the actual industry input. We were just oh. selecting a few for this. So you're, well, we'll you, you answered it. So we're good. We'll hit it again if we need to. That's a tough okay. one. Okay. Yeah. So Alan, Alan asked one more question that I was going to put out there, and then he should absolutely come on. Um, Given the limited time frame for effective climate action, should production stage impacts become a focus? What I love about this question is it's a yes or no, and the answer is yes. So, <laughs> no, it, it is. It's it's exactly where we need to be, right? And um, it, it those are the, the, you know we're from folks like y'all. Those are like okay, we got to start doing this differently. We got to start thinking about this. And so we have to go back to the source and all these other kinds of places to really understand how these things are coming together. But you had some, you had a perspective. When you're asking these kinds of questions so I, I wanted to get your thoughts on them yeah i mean first of all i want to thank you guys for a great uh meeting you have brought up so many things and answered so many of the points that i was trying to raise in so we actually answered questions. some questions for you That's sure good. no and you did a great job too and i i'm giving you an a plus but seriously you know the, those questions were all actually one big kind of question yeah. which is something you guys have also answered, which is how does an institution like the OBO with a huge portfolio do things that a de developer developing a single building or a, even a district or a homeowner can't really do, which is develop their own system of criteria for these sorts of assessments and measurements that Anna has raised, which are really, really important. Systemic measurements um, that we can make of the benchmarks from the benchmarks to the new buildings that we're aspiring to make that will try to solve some of these huge environmental questions and and you guys you guys have the power to do that and so i in a sense i i think the alphabet soup of all the different possible uh, assessment and 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 certification programs are are really you're you're way beyond that you have we we have the capacity to develop uh, responsive measurement systems using the kind of tools that Anna's talking about and the thinking that she's describing, and many of you are, uh, Chris uh, 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 has. Um, and, and I, what, what I just want to promote is the idea that in addition to the building the buildings, we're taking something from some other place, as some of you have mentioned, and we can actually demonstrate those sort of entangled relationships with natural systems or, you know, theoretically natural systems. Um, with the buildings that we make, and I and and so that's kind of where I'm coming from. It's not exactly a beef. I know I sound like a pest, but but it's it's really uh, just trying to kind of understand that what the capacity of OBO with its great work, incredibly talented team, a bunch of great advisors, um, and a lot of projects, um, how they can be a demonstrate real systems thinking, even if it's only experimental in a couple of places. So, Angel, your mention of the project where we're kind of restoring landscapes as well as building buildings in, I think it was Delhi, that's a great example. I think we should do that and I think we should publicize it because it's really powerful messaging as well as good science and, and responsible buildings. Yeah, it's part of that embassy effect, right? That we're doing more than just exactly. putting the buildings down. And what you're describing is exactly the conversations that Rick and I have been having is that you know, we're, our organization is maturing beyond, you know, the, the, the sort of certificates that are kind of out there and that because our stuff is unique and that's kind of what, how we think about it, especially in all the different kind of locations that we're in, is we can start to set a baseline of what our expectations are for what those buildings will be that aren't connected to the ways that, you know, are traditionally being done, but because they're important to us in the sort of diplomatic realm that we want to make sure that, you know, we're hitting on these particular topics. So, I, you know, it, you know, Christy, one, one of the things that I will put down as, as a marker for one of the roundtables is exactly what Alan and um, Anna were both describing is that, is there a set of requirements from which we want to build? You know, what are those things that are important to us? And then how do we, how do we narrate that 
to our consultants and contractors because part of what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to start telling people, hey, we're moving down this path. And you have to tell them the why, right? Why is this important for us? Why is it important for the State Department? And why is it important for the planet? And then start to implement these things in a way that's, you know, digestible and, and attainable by the, you know, the folks that are, that are building and maintaining it. So I, I think you're right on, Alan. This is exactly where we want to be and the reason why we have these conversations. So the next one, the next one, Christy, not this afternoon, uh, but is really to start to talk about, you know, what are the kinds of things that we want to start baking into our requirements? Yeah, and I, if I could just say one more real quick thing about this idea of the kind of front-loaded carbon spike that this huge built, global building boom is going to produce through just embodied emissions at the first stage of building life cycle. I, I think what Kimberly said is fundamental. Like, yes, we're building for people, absolutely, and we want to make beautiful things that are effective, but we don't want to create a bunch of impact right at the beginning of what we build and then spend decades trying to pay off that impact through efficient operations. So we have mm -hmm. to focus on decarbonization because without decarbonization, we don't really, we aren't really truly solving uh, building problems for people. We're actually creating more. And, and so I just really want to, I want to highlight what she said, this decarbonization problem. I don't mean to just harp on that, but that's the first step because if we can't get that right, we're going to create a whole bunch of impacts. So that, that, that's my carbon spike question here. And I just want to clarify that. Thank, Alan, thanks. I jump in and say two words for the 400 and something people and all of us and all the firms. So the thing that's the magical, I think, I think about this discussion is that the only way that's going to happen is if a lot more people are trained in the to think this way, but also to have the ability to be part of this um, decarbonization. So it can't just be about like, you know, things, but it really has to be about more people being able to answer these questions. And I think that's what's really exciting about this portfolio is that it really touches so many people in the industry in all of these different countries. Yeah, you know, it's funny as uh, for for Alan, the reason why you're here is because we had we had read some stuff about the work that you're doing in Timber City. And we're like, oh, we got to talk to this guy, see what he's doing, because I think it has a big impact on our on our portfolio. And that's kind of why you're here and why we want to have these conversations with everybody else that's on the panel. Um, I think we have a really good shot of making a really big difference and, and leading, at least in thought, if not in action, in all these different kinds of things and being an example uh, to those different cities that we're going to be working. That's kind of one of the cool things about the work that we do is that they're all over the world. And I'll, I'll tell you that ambassadors, when they're doing ribbon cutting and certainly when they're inviting guests over to come to the embassy, they they talk about our buildings. It, it's a way to open up the conversation. They're talking about the art. They're talking about the architecture. It's really what we're talking about there in the embassy effect. It's the, the beginnings of starting that dialogue uh, that is diplomacy, but based on the kinds of things that obviously are important to us that are probably could be impactful to them. Yeah. Chris, yeah, I, may yeah, I just say one that, quick thing? Please. Angel? Okay. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. I think Alan mentioned that he didn't mean to harp on rapid and deep decarbonization, but I do. I absolutely <laughs> mean to harp on it because it's going to be really hard for us to do, and we keep kicking the can down the road. And that's what we have to stop. And I hope that's what OBO is going to, you know, is going to take this, this executive order um, and Biden has really embraced it and say, this is what we're going to do because it's going to be, it's politically really difficult because it's, you know, it's the fossil fuel companies are not embracing this. So I will harp on it. I think it's what we have to do immediately, what we have to do yesterday. And it's really hard. It, it is hard, but if, if it was easy, we would have done it a few years ago, right? So it, it's okay that it's hard. I think we get, well, I don't think I do, but I think most of us get paid enough to do something that's really hard. So that I think that's completely fine. And, you know, some of the things that we're doing, it's some of the work that we're aspiring to do, especially around mass timber, isn't necessarily because of the things that you're talking about, but because of the other things that it does too, in terms of the things that we want to do. Like if we want to build faster, cheaper, uh, you know, with better quality and start to leverage offsite manufacturing and the work that we do, Mass Timber plays a really significant role in that. Imagine right now, when we talk about the economic effect for embassies effect, um, 
25 to 35% of the costs of construction go straight into those cities overseas because we're buying materials, we're buying labor. What if that percentage of money is going to places here in the United States because of the things that you guys are talking about and we're doing it here? Um, you know, we can increase quality. You know, you, if you're building stuff in a factory, we, we, can, we can make sure things are being done the right way, the kinds of inspections that we want to do from a security perspective. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of benefits beyond the things that you're talking about around carbon that are really kind of extra added benefits to, to some of the approaches that you guys have raised today. No, I think um, these are all such great points. And I want to uh, let Stacey um, Smedley come on. I know she's had her hand raised for a little bit. And, and I trying to be polite, raise my hand. Asked, asked, her her about, to... <laughs> asked her about carbon. So I, I want to make sure she gets forward. I just want to say, I, mean, I think um, I want to make the point that it, it is true that OBO should and, and and can be a leader in this, but there are private owners that have portfolios that are also global that are tackling this right now, putting together language to address this and really trying to come up with the, the right way to approach this for the design community. And the more we can align and harmonize that from pi private to public and make sure those same asks and requirements are, are harmonized, the faster we're gonna make these impacts and the faster we're gonna decarbonize because the market signal is gonna be clear and, and the message is gonna be the same. So I just wanna put that out there, the working group Please put me on it because we've got the connections with those those private companies that also are working all over the world trying to address this. And I think there's a real power trying to bring all that together. So it's intergovernmental, but also public and private when it comes to how we're we're proposing this language and requirements. No, and I it's it's funny th this conversation and Angel and Curtis and I were just on a on a conversation with the group Design for Freedom and talking about a different issue, but. It's, you know, combating modern slavery through material purchases and it's kind of, we kind of came to the same thing that it's, a, it's maybe more expensive to do it the right way. It's maybe, but we're at a point where is that really even the point of the question? It's, there is a, there is the right way to do it and we just have to do it. And Glennon Doyle tells us we can do hard things. So I, <laughs> we can, we can take the time. Um, so I, we have a few more questions. I, we, do, we have about 10 minutes left or 10 or so minutes left in this session as we're we're focused on the carbon piece. Um, I, I was going to, Curtis, uh, someone asked, they, they asked the question that you mentioned savings um, against a baseline, um, but especially since performance targets were emphasized earlier, why is the carbon target not performance-based? I thought maybe you guys could address that. Well, it, it could be. It very well could be. And uh, yeah, I did see that question. And measuring backwards from zero to where we are is the other way to do it. So I think that's definitely a feasible approach is looking at what our emissions are and then figure out how to get it down to zero. So rather than sort of here's where we are, what can we reduce it to? I was specifically purposing measuring the reduction, but absolutely we, it could, they could be performance based. I think there's two parts of this, you know, our, our building program is one thing, our existing facilities is another. Right or follow on renovation type of projects. So there's multiple ways to look at this, uh, um, and, and we'll get there. Um, and there. There's a couple of questions. I'm going to kind of group them together, um, but I think they're important to address because the reason we open these meetings and this conversation up to the public is so people have a sense of what the professional and the academic world is advising the government, what we're hearing, what we're listening, and how we're responding. Um, and some of these questions are, are to the point of how are we capturing this information and what are we doing with it? So I did want to kind of throw those out, add a little bit, and then open it up to our folks to respond. Um, but two of the questions are, can collaboration with industry slash academic partners add unstructured or detailed to a portfolio of 167 facilities, many of which are existing conditions and benchmarks for lead improvements, a learning and documenting process required to model existing portfolio to foster future OBO careers is one of the questions. Um, and another one was, what is the process for engaging with industry and gathering feedback as the sustainability plan is developed based on these new goals and executive order? So I just wanted to take a moment to to talk about how what we do with this information um, following this session and how we keep the public apprised of this process. Um, so these annual meetings that are open to the public, this conversation is recorded. We capture the recommendations ultimately that are made. Um, and then we report annually on what we accept, what we're still reviewing, and what we have said we're not going to accept. Those are all tracked um, through through a, a, a process done annually that GSA manages for all
all federal advisory committees. Um, so for those of you that are on and you want to stay tuned with this, um, we also put reports out at the end of the year that talk more about what we're doing. In addition, um, like Angel mentioned, this round table, uh, we offered that we probably should do that on design criteria. Um, we would open that up to the public so you could attend if you'd like. We also then do that readout. So that earlier session with the IG where they kind of read out the projects and programs they talked about, that round table would be a part of that of that open session. So um, there is a formal process for, for organizing these conversations. So I did want to make sure um, that those listening and that are that are that want to know more that they can. Um, and then I also just kind of wanted to open it up to you, um, Angel, if you wanted to comment on that. And I did want to add one other piece. This is more of a comment um, than it is a question, but I thought it was a really good one. And I wanted to make sure I left it with you guys. Um, OBO is OBO positioned to be the spearhead of the US AEC industry best practices for design and construction due to our broad stakeholders and extreme remote sites, constraints, and program. So I thought you would have a comment on that. The answer is hell yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, we, yeah, that being one of the things that. Uh, Don't make us start bleeping you. No, I'm not gonna, I didn't do anything. I just said hell, heck yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the things that sort of Christy had written in the notes uh, prior to this was talking about being the best in government. Which, which is which is a good uh, a good goal, but I think small in, in what we're trying to achieve. And uh, I want to really be working towards being the best in industry, and, and that's kind of where I think we should be. We have a platform like not a lot of other people do, uh, and that's why I think we can be a spearhead for this and, and be a bellwether for some of the things that we're talking about here. Uh, you know, Christy and I joke all the time that people answer our calls all the time. You know, you call and say it's the State Department, they'll pick up. You know, if, if it's just me by myself, no one's answering that phone, maybe because they think we're like checking on their visa or their passport or something, but they always pick up the phone. Uh, and then we press a little bit about, you know, hey, we want to talk to you about this, we want to talk to you about that. And that's kind of how all these things have started. We've not been laser focused and going, okay, I know what I want to do and let me go find the right people. It hasn't been that. It's been this sort of casual collaboration with a bunch of the folks that you're seeing on the call today. Uh, asking them questions that we don't have the answers to and say, hey, do you think you can help us? And it's been it's proven to be wildly successful. And what's cool, one of the things that we look for in our organization and is uh, we look for people that are passionate about our work. It makes your life so much easier. People care about what you do the same way that you do. And when we start talking about some of the things that we're talking about today, you can hear from them. They are crazy passionate about the things that they're doing and are taking that passion, sort of layering it in on the work that we do. So, yes, I, I think we we I think we are a leader, but we can be more of a leader in this. Uh, I think we have a stage that we need to start using more, and that's kind of the conversations that Christy and I have, uh, not only domestically but internationally. There's a lot of good things happening in the program. We're only recently starting to talk about it. MC twenty fifty is a small sliver of that, um, but you know, there's we were having the, what Christy was talking about. You know, making sure that you know the. The materials that we're using aren't a part of forced labor. There's a lot of things we're already doing in construction to to raise the the level of um, to, to raise you know how we deal with people in that in that in that atmosphere. And you know, and a lot of it has to do with you know making sure that no one's engaging in human trafficking. That you know, there's a certain more a certain amount of caloric intake that's expected for all the workers, providing them specific amounts of rest uh, to prepare. I'll tell you one of the things I'm, I'm super crazy proud of. We have about 13,000, 15,000 workers uh, overseas and, uh, you know, uh, construction workers overseas and our construction facilities and security management group has in working with the state department have vaccinated 90% of them. That's huge. That's absolutely huge. And 90% is better than most states that we have, if not better than all the states. Um, that's a huge number. Imagine what you're able to do to ensure that those people that are working on our projects, not only are able to do our projects, but continue to be able to provide a platform to, you know, make sure that their family is fed and whatever. So we're doing some really wonderful things here. We need to talk about them more. We need to do more. It's not enough for us to do good projects. We need to be doing good in the in the world in the ways that I think everybody has talked about today. Um, 
Thanks, guys. The, ne the next question, I think it's a two part one. And the second part is really important, I think, for a lot of folks. It's we're talking about a lot of great ideas, but how do they participate? How do they get contracts to do this work with us? Um, and what will be the mechanisms for this to happen? Um, so the first part of the question is, will we begin to now see more and more smaller projects utilizing photovoltaic, green roofs, wind power, recycled materials, etc.? And if so, will they be put in place? in place an IDIQ contract for just these type of projects. Um, and Angel, maybe in addition to answering, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about the, the net zero potential for some of our smaller posts. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna, one quick little story. One of the things that we ask employees that when they wanna work here is, you know, why do you wanna work here? It's a really simple question, but people mess it up. And so one of the things that we ask is, why do you wanna work here? If they say, we love to travel, or I need to get a pay raise, that's an automatic no. <laughs> and so your question is actually phrased the right way, right? So it, you're not asking about, hey, how do I make money? You're talking about, hey, how's this opportunity sort of evolving? So, Too uh, bad it was anonymous. They don't get, oh, no, it's not. Scott, we... Scott's got his name on there. He's, he's put himself out there. Um, so the first one about, you know, will there be more smaller uh, projects? The answer is yes. Uh, Rick's team is actually working towards that. There's a whole thing called the energy program where we're starting to do a lot more of that. I'm going to turn that over to Rick. This is an easy one for you, Rick. It's called softball. I can, I can hit this one. Yeah, so go ahead and knock this one out of the park and tell them what, kind of what we're doing and what we're moving towards. I mean, largely for us, it comes down to budget, right? Um, one of the great things about the, uh, the executive order and this uh, current push with the administration is they specifically asked us to ask for what we needed in our budget to execute. Um, right now, you guys all probably understand the government budget process. It's, uh, it's long and, uh, and a lot of people can knock things down. Uh, right now, our ask is still in the budget for 2023. It's not happening overnight just because of the, the process. Um, but that's in, in staffing and money for, for the program, uh, studies, and for projects. Um, long ways to go before we actually see that money, but right now it's hopeful and it looks good. Um, we've had an energy program that's done uh, photovoltaic projects um, fairly consistently for, I don't know, the last 10 years plus. Um, but we've only had funding for three, you know, two, three, maybe four a year. When you talk a portfolio as large as ours, that's a you know small drop in the bucket for where we need to get to. Um, our capital projects uh, have been doing these uh, uh, renewable energy uh, for quite some time as well, which certainly helps. Um, but we're hoping we can ramp that up significantly um, over the years. Um, don't have the money yet. So like I said, uh, um, the history, the government's uh, you know kind of famous for unfunded mandates. You know, they say you have to do something, but they don't fund it. So far, uh, it's looking good for the getting this funding through. Yet to be seen. Um, and then the last part of that, Rick, on the IDIQ yes. contract for this. Do you have any comments on that part of it? Uh, for the IDIQ contracts, um, in the past, we did have a specific IDIQ contract for um, for energy and sustainability. Um, I think for various reasons, you know, with our contracting office uh, bureau that we deal with for a contract, and it kind of fell off. Um, I would love to have a specific uh, IDIQ for this type of work because I think it's fairly specialized, especially the uh, um, renovation type of work. Um, yet to be seen whether we'll we'll do that though. Um, I think it's a good idea. See, Rick, the way that I would have answered this question is yes and yes, um, <laughs> and, and the reason being is that what we're not, you know, when we talked about these different facets of sustainability and the kinds of things that we're talking about, it's not only one thing, right? So it's not about. I think what you're talking about here is. It's not about selling PV. It's about selling energy independence. And that's what people can get their head around. Right? So when we were talking about uh, sustainability in the past and trying to be a good neighbor and those kinds of things, what we've added to that conversation is that we can be in a position to make sure that we're not reliant on host government for energy. And there are some countries, if you can believe it or not, are big fans of ours. And so they do. They turn off the power. And we have to run diesel generators and let the trucks come in. So if you could be in a position where you're adding PV in a place that is like that and, and what you're selling is really kind of energy independence, that's huge for us. And I think that's what people will buy. So like at the project level, we're pushing our, our minimums in terms of scale of those PVs because we see the value in doing it. You know, Rick's team on this energy program has done some PV in the South Pacific and pretty small posts with big land. And we're, I think we're going to be at net zero when those, when those projects are finished, that, that's exactly kind of where we want to be. And then in terms of an IDIQ, yes, that's where I want to be too. Um, I think you have, to start, you have to start building momentum on this uh, and take advantage of the sort of situation that we're in, build upon it so that in the future, it is something that we are just doing. And 
it's hard to say it's not the right thing to make sure that we're independent of the sort of energy constraints that might be available in a particular country of ours. So uh, I, I'd say yes, yes, in a very fun kind of way. <laughs> All right, Christy, go. All right. And by the way, it's 1252 EST, and I'm starving, so I want to know what other questions we have. Well, you got to hang around for the public and understand. Public. I know this, and no sandwiches are here. I don't know what's going on. All right. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question before we close this out, and it's a question about our London embassy, and I did want to make sure that we that 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 we got that answer out. Speaking of LEED, have uh, have other sustainable certifications been considered? Um, for example, BREAM, um, and they wanted to know if the London embassy was going to be BREAM certified, and I know it was, so I'm going to let Curtis or Rick confirm. Yeah, normally our, uh, you know, our requirement is to meet the federal performance goals and we use LEED just universally as our way to meet those federal performance goals. We're not required to use uh, LEED, but that's what we have as an organization decided to use. But we went after BREAM certification and, I, and we're actually considering some projects a uh, well certification. So absolutely we consider alternative certifications on our projects. Okay. And 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 London was Bream, right? Wasn't it Bream outstanding? Bream outstanding. Outstanding, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, great. Um, like performance review. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I, I did want to give Dean Boone an opportunity to come back on. I know his hand was raised. I don't know if it was uh, if that was a form a little bit ago, but I did notice it. So I did want to see if anybody wants to have any last words. But I will open it up to him first. Yeah, just quickly, I wanted to comment on one of the questions about OBO careers, and I think we focus a lot rightly on thinking about a 50 year time horizon for the buildings and the campuses and so forth. But I think it's worth thinking about a 50 year time horizon for what the careers are there. They're, they're going to be supported by that work and what's necessary to make it successful. And again, I just want to reiterate this whole wave of people coming who are really looking for these kinds of opportunities. So, uh, thanks. No, I'm actually, it's funny, Angel, Angel and I met Dean Boone because we went out to say, hey, we, we want to talk to you about recruiting and programs. And uh, one of the things that is, is really important to our, our front office has been um, for, for a few years now is, is this recruiting aspect. Because with the understanding that, you know, we, we have to listen and make change and follow what you guys are doing, we're going to have to have people here um, to, to care and want to implement those, those, those important changes. Um, and it's no small thing, as Kimberly said, on both sides of it. Um, uh, so um, we are. We are actively recruiting, um, and actually, I'll put this out to the IG. Uh, many of you are alumni, and some of you have uh, kindly um, connected us to your career fairs or invited us to join you on a panel to talk about opportunities to work here. Um, but we 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 are we've got a really active uh, social media campaign for recruiting. Um, if any of you guys could share those jobs, we'd really appreciate it because I I think it's a really great point that um, it it's it's great for us to set all these standards, but we have to have people here in the seats to be able to execute them and care enough about them here to keep moving them. So, um, and it's, I think we can all test it's a great place to work. So, um, join us, but I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. Hey, Christy, I would add one thing. It's, it's a thing that sort of Kimberly mentioned during MC 2050, you know, when we're talking about recruiting people, it's also about, it's, it's changing the culture of the way that we think about doing this job. And, and that's a lot of, that's harder, uh, and so I think part of it is recruiting the right kinds of people that have the right kinds of skills to move us forward. And the other one is to take our existing uh, staff and make sure they understand the value of the work that they're doing and how they all kind of work in this broader system in the way that sort of Anna described. So anyway, uh, yeah, there's a, this is, I think this is the marker for a whole lot of awesome things that are be moving our way in the future. Awesome. And actually, that's a great segue into our last uh, our last session, which is the opportunity for us to put the questions from um, from those that have been listening um, patiently and intently for the past couple of hours to get their feedback um, to you guys um, to and to and back to them. So um, the first one that I'm going to put out, I'm going to ask Henry and Victoria, Angel, Tracy, um, Adam, Jeff, if you guys want to um, contribute to this and may, maybe we first turn over to, to Victoria or Henry. But um, the question was a really good one. It was, is OBO exploring change management strategies within the organization? A lot of these ambitious ideas and systems have been present in design explorations, but there is often a hesitancy within OBO to do something new. Change is hard, so this must be a part of the implementation plan. 
I thought this was a great way for us to kind of kick off all these other things we're going to talk about. So um, I'd like to turn it over to, to some of our leadership to comment on that. I know we're doing a lot of great things. And Christy, I'll just say a word or two, then pass it over to Victoria if she's available. Um, but, you know, yes, change in a large organization, large government bureau is, is quite hard. You know, we, you know, I came on board in 2018 and, that, and the team here was already discussing about, you know, reimagining the organization and how, you know, we could try to adapt and bring change into what we do, improve our process, innovate. And so there was a, uh, an effort to try to look across, you know, basically five broad areas that we thought were priorities for us. And, um, you know, one area was the embassy after next, um, which again, you know, Angel and his team had been looking at, you know, with, you know, and sort of using that approach, that idea of, of how do we think, you know, longer term and, and feeding that into, you know, and operationalizing it through the embassy 2050 approach. Um, we also looked at how we could you know, enhance what we do with our residences. You know, we, we talk a lot about the buildings, but um, we have something like 16,000 lease or owned properties. And a vast majority of that is our residences. And just, you know, we focus a lot on these buildings, you know, where people work, but we also have to think about the conditions they're living in. And so we wanted to look at a better approaches to managing that. The other aspect of, of what we realized we needed to adapt to was just, you know, again, we focus a lot on the new facilities and trying to make them better. Um, but we're in a lot of existing facilities. How do we maintain them more effectively? What are the approaches we should be taking for that? Um, and then, you know, as, as discussed, you know, we, you know, the idea about people and how do we think about the skills we have and the skills we should have and the people we want to try to, you know, open ourselves up to get a, a cross section of, of skills and people across the United States. And then, you know, the fundamental piece is also data. You know, we talked a lot about data. So, you know, we looked at across all these five areas and then working, you know, in various teams, trying to incorporate some of these ideas, new ideas, approaches that we could take. And it's, it's, it's a slow process. Um, you know, it, it, there, that is the challenge within government. You, walk, you operate within certain constraints, whether uh, reg, regulations, laws, or, you know, just the nature of how we change, um, you know, our staffing and personnel. So. You know, there, there have been some constraints, but it is something that we're very aware of. We've tried to be very strategic about it. And I think we, over the last few years, have made some significant changes and strides in incorporating and adapting approaches to change. Um, so just throw that over to uh, Victoria if she had any additional thoughts on any of that. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. And, and I do think when I hear the word change management and I think about how uh, we're, we're applying it in these instances that we've been talking about today, uh, mass timber offsite manufacturing uh, climate um, that that really just just touches the like skims uh, the top of what I think we're doing in the culture of change that we have at OBO. I really believe we are a learning organization. I believe that a lot of the efforts at the grassroots level um, from planning to looking at how we operate our facilities to looking at transitions to commissioning, um, looking at ways to improve process, obviously focusing on scope, schedule, and budget, that type of thing. But all of the efforts that we've got going on behind the scenes really are evidence of uh, a culture of change and a culture of continuous improvement. And, and something that we didn't talk about, and it's probably a little bit too inside baseball for this group today, but we've, we have a series of talent management advisory committees that are working to reinforce. So things like recruitment, retention, recognition, you know, a lot, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, all of these things that we're working on that sort of support this um, environment of con continual growth and continual change really kind of are mutually reinforcing. So you see it, um, it's bubbling up in some of these individual programs where we're really trying to, to look at what industry is doing and how we can partner and learn from industry. But I think there's a sustained uh, sort of uh, culture of change that, that really exists in OBO and we're really trying to capitalize. Um, and and uh, I, think, I think you're seeing results already. Thanks so much, Henry and Victoria. Um, uh, Tracy or Angel, I don't know if you have anything that, that you want to add, or Adam. If not, we have a lot. We have a lot more questions. No, Victoria covered the thing that was important: the team, the team back, which is she gave you the the breakdown of it. But yeah, that's we recognize it's important, and we're working towards it in the, in those efforts. 
Great. Okay. Um, our, our next question, it's switching gears a little bit, but I, I did want to give a shout out to Bob Castro, who is also, uh, like many of you on here, a long old time friend of OBO's um, and thank him for staying so engaged w with our program and always interested to connect us to to the to the people that might be helping us move our mission forward um but he has a really good question um for rapidly changing cities um ex for example hanoi or topographies climate hydrology or natural and built environment how can obo site acquisition staff and architects engineers supporting projects track evolving site conditions pre and post acquisition that could impact constructability or security so I, I feel like I could go Jason Delara or <laughs> or Angel or Rick or go Jason Delara. Let him you yeah. know do his thing for thirty five minutes and then we'll wrap up. I'm just kidding. And we'll all be smarter. Yeah, Jason's on, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. No, my warm up is about thirty five, but I'll, I'll try yeah, to fix that. Then no, you I get mean, into the show. Yeah. So so th this is, I mean, there are lots of parts to this, but I. I would say, you know, for cities like Hanoi, they're incredibly challenging for us on the site acquisition side because they're so big and there's so many different parts uh, of a city. It's kind of like Washington, D.C., you know, for those of you from around here. I mean, there are lots of different parts of D.C., lots of neighborhoods, lots of great places to live, right? But for us, when we think about sites, we, what, what we want to think about is connect back to the core mission of the Department of State. I mean, that's what we're all talking about here, right? What is our mission, right? It's diplomacy. And diplomacy is about people. It's about connecting with people, connecting with governments. So our sites have to be in those kinds of locations. You know, one of the bits, again, talking back, again, about Washington, D.C., you know, you, you take a place like Tyson's Corner or Reston or some of these places in, in the metro D.C. area. I mean, they're great places to live, right? You have great housing, great schools, great parks. Uh, you know, office, uh, residential, but you know what's not in those places? Embassies aren't in those places, right? And the reason is because it's not, it doesn't advance the core mission of embassies. So we, whatever we're doing, I mean, all of everything that we're talking about today is super important. Every piece of it is important, but we have to remember what the department's core mission is. It's about diplomacy. And part of that is being in a location that advances diplomacy. So, so that's about being in the city center, being where, where governments are that we can connect with, being where people are uh, that we can connect with. So, um, so that's it kind of from the site acquisition side and, and what we're trying to do with, with locations. Yeah, and one of the things that Victoria knows well is that, you know, even if we're charging towards a site in a particular city, some governments want to change their capital. That literally happens more than you think. Uh, and so we have to deal with those kinds of things. But, you know, I'll give you one example on understanding the sort of conditions. You know, we have a, we're set to make a pretty big investment in Manila. And uh, Victoria's master planning folks were really trying to take a look at, you know, what the need was and all these kinds of things. And they engaged, engaged our climate security resilience folks, who was also working with DOD, NOAA, and NASA, these others, to find out what we could determine would be sort of sea level rise issues, tsunami kinds of things at that particular location. And what we found is that in 2050, that where our embassy was, it was going to be completely uh, underwater because due to sea level rise. Our buildings weren't, right? Because we had designed our buildings to make sure that we were able to, to withstand these kinds of things, but everybody else around us was going to be underwater. So it's this information, I think, that what Jason described about, you know, these sites evolving over 50, 80 year periods, you just, you're not going to be able to tell if, if I could predict that I probably would be working here, but you have a, a flood, you know, you have an initial understanding of what this is, try to gather information from technical folks to understand uh, what that is, make sure the security folks are embedded to understand how things are evolving. And then uh, we make the best decisions we can. And then like what you're saying here is you have to consistently start to track that stuff to make sure that uh, we're still in the place that uh, we need to in order to do our jobs or their jobs. Okay. Um, we've got an, our next kind of grouping of questions um, are, I, I think we're gonna be interesting. We have a, we have a bunch of self safety, health, environmental management folks, facility managers, um, and a lot of people in interiors, folks that, that, that understand the importance of well-being and also obviously our design teams. Um, but there are two questions that were kind of organized um, in, in, in that area. The first one is, has an emphasis on connection to nature uh, come up in Embassy Effect or Embassy 2050 discussions as a method to help OBO 
bridge the gap between climate, diplomacy, community, and health slash well-being goals. And then um, the other one is about well-certified buildings. And it's um, the OBO program significantly reached so many sustainable initiatives and human environmental considerations. Do you see well-building strategies and standards considered in future metrics? Yes, so the answer to both of those is yes. Uh, we're, we're looking at them now. Uh, the, the well building strategies is something that our interior design group is, is, is actually looking at today to see what will be incorporated in our standards. And then the, um, yeah, thanks for people that need glasses like me, uh, for the bio, uh, biophilic design stuff. Yeah, we're, we're looking at that too. Uh, there's a whole host of things that we think we should be introducing in the buildings to make sure that, uh, we can improve the quality of life for our occupants in the same way that uh, Victoria's team is working on the quality of life uh, for the residential side of the house. Uh, but yes, we are looking at both of those things. Let Maybe me add can... real quick. We do have several uh, well and fit well certified staff and trying to grow that as we go. We're looking at both programs, uh, whether we incorporate that as a certification that we go after or not is yet to be seen, but uh, we will certainly uh, incorporate uh, the best practices of it, at least, if not the certification part of newer standards. Yeah, and, and if I could add, also, you know, within our organization, we also have a safety health office that does, you know, the industrial health and safety issues. And this, um, in addition to just what we can control with our facilities, one of the challenges we do face is, um, you know, if you look at a lot of the developed countries uh, that we talked about, where there's high concentrations, growing populations, high urban density, uh, especially in, in Eastern Asia. Air quality remains a, a consistent problem, air quality globally in those areas. And so we have tried to work with the regional bureaus that do our policy and how we can support them as they try to engage with host governments as well in addressing just uh, air quality writ large. It impacts on the communities there as well as our diplomatic communities. And so it is a big issue, you know, within the building uh, around our compound, but then also in how we engage on a policy level with um, with host governments on questions of air quality in general. So I think, you know, OBO, you know, has a role in so many different levels when we look at these kinds of environmental issues. Thanks. Thanks everybody. And Rick, uh, there, there was this, the one additional one that asked about the SRP, do we see a change in SRPs overall? I, I think you generally addressed that, but I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that goes with it. We've been making a lot of changes to our space requirements program with SRPs. Um, over the years, a lot to create that flexibility that we've been talking about for a portfolio. You know, the world's changing, staffing's changing. We're trying to be as flexible as we can going forward uh, for programmatic reasons, um, but certainly looking at the health and wellness as part of that. Um, and we'll certainly be making uh, future changes to that. Uh, it's a continuing to develop the program for us, uh, keeping up. Uh, you know, the pandemic kind of opened eyes to certain things. We felt we were doing. Uh, quite well in some things, uh, other things we can certainly improve upon and, and we're making changes uh, consistently to that program to keep up with uh, uh, the best industry practice we can. Great. Yeah, and Rick, I'll also add that, um, you know, we are the client for a lot of you, but we also have our own clients and that's POST. And POST is made up of not only the State Department, but a whole bunch of other sort of tenants from across government. And so part of our Embassy 2050 effort is not only to understand the drivers that are going to impact the built environment, but, but to also understand how those drivers are going to impact the way that our tenants are going to be doing their work and the kinds of needs that they're going to have. So part of our sort of phase two, once we start to understand what's happening in the world, is to really talk to all these different kinds of tenants of ours and say, now that you understand that these are the things that are going to happen in the world over the next 30 years, how is it going to change the way that you work and how does that, how does that impact what kinds of spaces we provide to you in the future? So they're they're all kind of interconnected. We don't do these things all our own. You know, we we have uh, partners in all these different agencies that are responsible for sort of talking to us about their needs. Um, we standardize a lot of stuff because these buildings have to be flexible. But in 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 many cases, we we tune uh, spaces for the particular tenants requirements in a way that can be continually, you know, used and reused in different kinds of ways. So not only are we going to be making changes, but we're going to be talking to our tenants about the kinds of changes that they will need moving forward, especially around uh, health and wellness. Thanks guys. Okay. Next group is focused on BIM. Um, 
which is something we're obviously we're working on hard here too. And I know there are probably a lot of OBO folks in the audience that are going to be glad to hear this and the other ones that are coming in. Um, this one is integrated project delivery through GIS BIM BDC integration reduces cost time in design, construction, and maintenance. How are fees being shifted to address initial costs to provide a digital twin, exist conditions, or metrics that lead to more focused, sustainable outcomes or solutions? The fees are increasing. No, I'm just kidding. Um, what, what, what they're describing here in this question is what we're moving towards now. So we're not in the, in the neighborhood of digital twins yet, um, but we see real value in doing so, and that's kind of what we're moving our program towards uh, is, is building that that digital twin so that we can understand all the challenges of. Uh, of actually doing the construction digitally before we ever move it out in the field. So we're moving in that direction. Uh, we haven't gotten to a place where we're really understanding what the impacts of the fees are. Um, part of what we want to be doing is investing a lot earlier, a lot of our resources earlier, especially our technical resources earlier to, to plan and design these things so that when we move it through construction, um, they're really focused on constructing what's been identified as opposed to having to manage, manage changes, you know, either from OBO or other kinds of tenants. Uh, so we want to put construction in a place where they're going to be most successful and and being able to create digital twins that have all those requirements sort of really fleshed out is really key for them to be able to just focus on uh, on knocking out constructions in, in these kind of tough environments. Okay, um, there this the next one is. Um, Sorry, is uh, we have a lot of ones coming in. Um, when AEC vendors or global contractors choose specs or products, are their choices integrated by an OBO library of BIM objects, which track material, cost, quantity, stats, but also tracking sustainable attributes? Can data be accessed virtually by approved vendors or updated by on-site vendors? Rick, you might you, you might know more, know more than I do on this one. I, I do know that we have these these BIM models. I can't say that it has sustainability attributes baked into it, but it does have the the material cost and uh, quantity information in it. Um, yeah. Do you have any more on that, Rick? Yeah, we're we're growing our our BIM uh, library as we speak. Um, yes, you're speaking about uh, you know Embassy 2015 kind of forward looking and keeping up with technology. Uh, BIM for us has been one of those great lessons learned for OBO. You know, the industry's been using this stuff for a long time, and OBO is woefully behind. We played a lot of catch up in the last couple of years uh, to get our BIM standards up to where we need it. We're not there yet, but uh, we've got, made a lot of strides on the design side. Um, we're still working towards uh, taking those designs and moving into the construction world and then ultimately into the uh, operation and maintenance uh, realm because that's where it's uh, hugely beneficial. Um, so I think our library is still expanding. Uh, we haven't quite gotten to a lot of the equipment level yet, um, but certainly working towards that. And, and what I would expect too is I think some of these questions that maybe we are fumbling uh, to respond to, I, I, you know, we would address in writing. I, I think Chrissy, isn't that the sort of approach? Yeah, we're just kind of organizing them by thing. I think the next one we're going to go to is the REC program. There was a request to provide an update on the REC program, current backlog of work, types of projects under the program, execution strategy, um, how many firms are currently supporting it, and what has been our experience, the benefits of this program for OBO, and the outlook for continuing to use this resource. Um, I, I know we have talked a lot notionally at a higher level, um, and I know we are still working on executing this. I, I don't think it's actually out, but I didn't know if you guys had any updates for the for the industry partners. Sure. sure. Uh, REC is fairly new. It, it's an idea uh, where we where we work with our industry partners to execute the work. So what you have to imagine is in the federal government, you know, the civil service and all those people working directly in the building isn't growing. Uh, but Congress continues to give us money and there's all these demands uh, for smaller kinds of projects uh, for post. And so you have 290 missions. You can imagine the amount of workload that we have. Uh, and I mentioned before, there's like 600 ongoing projects at any one time, a variety of different scales. So the REC program was this idea of reaching out to an IDIQ to actually develop the, the scope uh, for the project and do the design and actually do the construction with a very, very light touch uh, inside the building in terms of having to manage the effort. And so far, it's not been around for too long, so it's fairly loose, but we're seeing a lot of success in it. Uh, maybe too much success in it, you know, it's, it's, it's actually going really, really well. So 
you know, we're probably our own worst enemy. So now you have posts coming in. Yeah, I want to be part of the rec program. We're like, All right, slow down. Wait a minute. So um, we've actually completed them only three projects. We have another 10 ongoing, um, six projects kind of ready to, to go to award. Um, you know, I think I saw you know, the question about the backlog. There isn't really currently a backlog that I'm aware of. But I, I know there's a story going around like that, but it's, I, I don't have it here. Um, there was a little bit of a slowdown, but a slowdown because there's this thing called COVID, but nothing more than that, really. So all those things are kind of a, a moving forward. We have about seven active contractors today. And the, the outlook really is more about the opportunity of growing that kind of program. So, you know, right now, REC is very focused on, I think what Rick and I would describe as sort of single discipline kind of projects where you have to kind of go in and sort of fix something. And so it's actually relatively straightforward. Um, we think there's this opportunity of, of maintaining that, building more of an IDIQ presence for that scale of projects, and then maybe tiering these things up a little bit. And that's kind of what we're in conversations about now is there's probably various scales of this kind of rec program approach uh, that might be beneficial uh, to us, especially on the facility side. So we're, we're, we're just, we're talking about it now. We really want to get a better sense of how this is working, the kinds of adjustments we need to make to the program so that we could deploy it at a bigger scale. That's rapid engineering and construction for people who don't know what REC is. Yeah, I didn't know what it meant, so thank you. <laughs> I was like, I just called the REC program. It's been for you, Angel, for those that don't know. I thought it was for recreation. I was like, oh, recreation program. That sounds fun. No, Angel's right. It was really developed as a way to try to execute uh, smaller projects that are, are kind of singular scope, uh, equipment replacements, chiller replacements, generator replacements, stuff like that, um, in a in a quicker manner uh, without the uh, um, trying to use all the processes that we use for the larger projects, just try to streamline it. Uh, I think it's been fairly successful. Uh, a lot of lessons learned over these first couple that we've done. It'll probably evolve a little bit as we go, but uh, I think we see promise in it at least. Great. Thanks, guys. Um... Moving to our next grouping of FEBR, everybody's favorite acronym, FEBR. Um, we've got some questions, um, and the first one is, can you provide an update on the, and for those that don't know, um, FEBR is the forced entry ballistic resistance materials. So can you provide an update on the FEBR program, including engagement of recent 8A awardees, current backlog of FEBR projects, and any challenges experienced by OBO in executing this work? So I don't trace or, or I don't know, Rick, Angel. Yeah, Tracy's best position to answer this, I think. That's what I thought. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, we've got three recent awardees who are uh, 8A. I wouldn't necessarily say we have a backlog. We just uh, survey the conditions and perform the work. So not sure what other kind of information they're looking for on this question. Great. And then the next question is, as Beijing CMR project shows the delicate balance of public and representational use, access, and private security considerations compared to chanceries, has OBO considered updating updating CMR, chief, which is Chief of Mission Residence, or DCR, or CGR design standards, utilization for FEBR to incorporate latest industry innovations for safe havens? And the answer is yes. So the, all those acronyms are really about just representational housing for the ambassador. Um, you know, we, we haven't done a lot of chief of mission residences uh, for a super crazy long time. And then all of a sudden we started to get hit on them because what we're seeing is that the, the representational facility um, is less residence and much more of a functional building. And so they're obviously being incorporated into our a new embassy compounds more and our new consulate compounds more. And then for Beijing specifically, we actually have a contractor that's in place now to actually look at the standards that you're, you're asking about here. Uh, because we, our standards are still relatively old, especially around these residences, uh, we're, we, we're beefing it up. And so we're actually in the throes of, of developing uh, more updated standards for those residences and the kinds of security features that, uh, that are required for them. Uh, because they, they function in a variety, I mean, I'm telling you these things, if you go to a lot of those of you that have been to a chief of mission residence, there's a small little three bedroom, two bath thing that is the residence. And then there's this other, you know, 6,000 square foot thing that is really for a lot of other kind of public events. And so um, not too dissimilar from a, an embassy, there, there really needs to be a segregation of these uh, different kinds of functions so that the residents are safe. So yeah, we are looking at the, 
standards today, and we're redeveloping them. And what one of the things that Rick's team has got is you know we have sort of regular kinds of building standards, and companions to that is that they're working on is the residential one, and then they're also doing one for um, special projects. Those are the only two I know about, but Rick, you might know more of the other ones. No, you're absolutely right, Angel. Um, and as far as new products, uh, we try to keep up with industry. We we fairly often have uh, vendors. Uh, reach out to us with new products for us to evaluate and, and get into our standards um, on products like these. When you start talking uh, FEBR, which is forced entry ballistic resistance, for those that don't know, um, you know, it's not just a design engineering thing. We have to pull in our, our security experts. Uh, we have an office of security management that helps with this. Um, and then our partners over in diplomatic security and make sure it meets their standards. And so quite often there's a pretty robust testing that needs to be going on. So our security, uh, uh, partners are comfortable that it will meet the standards. And so a lot of this just takes a little bit of time to get through these processes. But uh, once it does, we are more than happy to have a, a better product selection um, that might meet the need better. Uh, these FEBR doors especially tend to be very heavy, not always conducive to a representational type of space. And uh, anytime we can improve upon products and still meet our standards, we're, we're all for it. Great, okay. Next few questions, and we're almost out of time. And I, I, I'm surprised we we gave at least 30 plus minutes on this, and we still have unanswered questions. But um, we're going to try to close as many out as we can in the last few minutes. Um, the the next one is how much consideration is given when it comes to selecting materials and equipment? Are local label resources taken into consideration when designing a project? What are considered acceptable lead times for engineering, fabrication, and shipping in order to control the critical path? So two very different questions, but maybe you guys can answer them in one, in yeah, one amazing I, response. I think I'll start a little bit and turn it over to Tracy and Rick. Um, but I, I could talk a little bit about a, a process that we have in place now that helps to determine these sort of selections. It's called the project development survey. And essentially what it does, it's, it, its main thrust was really to identify how to do business in these particular countries. But what it's been evolving to is, is really how to execute construction and maintenance in addition to that in those countries. And so we've been working with our construction folks and our facility folks to sort of flesh out the questions in there so that we can understand exactly what is being described here in the question is what are the skills in that country? You know, what are the kinds of resources that are available there? Uh, you know, what are those kind of major uh, construction approaches that are that are executed in that particular country, as well as one of the maintenance services and skill sets of the of the post. And so those things start to inform um, the kinds of decisions that we make here, because what we recognize and, and, and Tracy certainly does is that we're not building these things in the United States. And so we need to be making decisions here uh, that we know are going to be executable in the future. But I'll turn it over to Rick first and then turn it over to Tracy. Uh, I, th I think you hit it there, Angel. Like I said, we we try to uh, come up with this data um, with our project development survey, along with our facilities team. Uh, we do survey the facility manager out at post when we're when we're working on the initial designs. Um, a lot of it's tough. You know, in some places there just aren't no aren't any local local uh, labor resources or or materials made in that in that place. And we try to look regionally the best we can. Um, we certainly have a challenge in that uh, with some of our um, secure areas of the building, getting uh, uh, local material versus U.S. material. Um, but it's certainly something we look to do. Um, I'll let Tracy try to you know, elaborate on that a little bit, but uh, we're doing a lot better on that than we used to. Um, and then part of it is our contracting rules. Like I said, the government, we have a uh, federal acquisition regulations that we have to follow, uh, but we're working on it. And Tracy. Rick, one of the things that, you know, We've been adding to the design process are those constructability reviews, uh, those maintenance reviews, obviously having those team members are part of uh, design conversations super early in concept so that it, as it moves through the process, you know, Tracy and her team have already been involved so that what they're picking up on the, on the back end is already something that we know that is executable. Tracy. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, thanks guys. I'll take the answer in a couple different directions as well to flesh out. Um, final selection of materials and equipment is is proposed by our contracting partners. And so they, they have a voice in, in how it's selected. Something that we're trying to change on that is to add a performance measure related to 
how which which equipment is selected can it be maintained and so it can't just be what's the performance of the equipment related to whatever hvac or electronic performance or whatnot but for an elevator for example you have to select one that also in the future could be maintained so what's the response time from a local supplier so that's something we're trying to add around around performance i think as far as use of local materials that of course is a huge lead benefit, and but then you balance that again again against what's available and and, and that kind of thing. As far as this answer, uh, this question: engineering, fabrication, and shipping. The the question is, I, is a little confusing to me. What's acceptable lead time? I mean, it it is what's required. This is one of the biggest challenges of working overseas is understanding supply chain logistics management. Mm -hmm. And so when proposals come in, in a, in a best value kind of scenario, we look for our contracting partners to understand those challenges and tell us what that's going to look like for uh, their engineering fabrication and shipping. Uh, regards design, those designs that have bespoke elements take longer fabrication. Of course, that's going to have a longer impact to get it to get it to the field. Um, I hope that answers Jason's question. Yeah, Tracy, just to add that, like, like you said, we, we largely leave that up to our contracts on, on the, on the larger projects. We leave that to the contractors and they need to order the materials soon enough. Deliver on site soon enough to not. Impact that critical path smaller projects. Uh, we have a little more play on that. We have to understand what those uh, lead times are. Um, but largely we kind of leave that to the contractors, I believe. And I'll add to that as well. Different contractors take a different approach on what do you include in early an early design package and some of it is site works, but sometimes it's better to get ready for the buyout for electrical mechanical. So you want to make those selections in an early design package so you can get the jump on on the supply chain. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna we we're we're almost out of time. I'm gonna we're I'm gonna close with what we've got one more question on commissioning and then Rick, there's a question on us adopting UN sustainable development goals. Uh, in our, in our standards, so I'm going to ask that 1 last, but I'm giving you a heads up. So, you know, it's coming to you. Okay, Tracy commissioning. I know it's 1 of your favorite. 1 yeah, of your favorite topics. Yeah, so I didn't um, want to miss it for you. All right, no, thank you. Um, safeguards in place. Commissioning can suffer when it's not performed by completely dishonored 3rd party. Yeah, we've got 3rd party commissioning on our projects. It's not something that's tacked on to the end of a project. It's got to be considered from the day 1 of the design criteria straight through. To design development, mobilize to the field. The QC program has to be robust to make sure all the systems are in place on pre functional tests, and then you move into performance tests, and then you have a, a commission project. I, so, so we, it, it is, it is third party. We've also added on in recent years, tried to strengthen our warranty management programs, and we implemented a operation and maintenance transition coordinator so that. When a, when a project is commissioned and turned over to the uh, operation and maintenance staff, they've got oversight of someone that's been involved in construction in the last year can carry it through to the, the opening part of operations. Um, well, language controls or oversight is in place to reduce the risk. Yeah, third party commissioning, that's what we're doing. Great. Okay. Next is next Rick, you're Rick, you're the last one. Well, how much consideration is given when it comes to selecting material or no, no, wrong one. <laughs> you're the other one. I'll read it. Has the OBO considered aligning and informing the development of the design standards and criteria with the UN sustainable develop goals, which is more broader than the other reference standards? Uh, we have not looked at that to date. I'm not saying that we won't. Well, you got the call. Uh, we probably could. We, 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 look, we do look at international standards at places. Uh, some, some local municipalities uh, enforce local standards sometimes. Um, we see that in, uh, in Europe, especially. Uh, we see that a lot with fire codes and, and uh, sometimes electrical codes. Uh, maybe not necessarily in our, in our building, but sometimes how we connect to local utilities. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly not opposed to looking at international standards uh, when it makes sense. Okay. Um, that's All my right. answer. And Henry, we didn't have time for it, but there was a question on hiring and the age restriction at 59 and we should look into that. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to send that your way too. I'm, oh. I'm really glad because I think there isn't enough time for the, 
for the public to push government the way that they should. So we're going to keep all your questions. We're if we if we didn't get to answer them now, we're going to make sure that we do. Um, we're so appreciative of you guys, um, you know, watching us and staying involved with our program. We are better because you're involved and engaged and push and ask us to do better things and we work for you. So, um, you know, I just want to thank you all so much for your really thoughtful questions and, um, you know, for, for listening in to um, and, and being interested in what we do. Um, if you want to know more or you want to work with us, there are a couple opportunities. We host monthly capabilities conversations. Um, it's a very weird name for something that's really awesome for you. It gives you a chance to come in and tell us about who you are, what you focus on, and how you might want to work with us. And then you get to interface with our leadership. Many of the people who were on the meeting today sit in um, and then talk to you about the things that they're focused on in your particular areas. Um, Lauren Luckett from External Affairs runs that whole program. She does a great job. But she's very responsive. You could email her too if you have questions. She's gonna be mad at me for saying that, but but definitely get in touch with her if if you're not getting what you need. But you can register your company. You can watch um, some presentations about us and then sign up to attend the next available session. Um, we also have a, a pretty active social media presence. We try to keep you guys up to date on awards that are coming out or awards that are made. Um, just big happenings. We recently are really proud that um, our our new U.S. Consulate General in Madam. Morris was awarded the Chicago Athenium uh, International Award, uh, uh, Design Award. So um, we, we kind of let you know about all those things. And then we work with you in professional organizations as well. We take the show on the road and go talk about what we do there. So um, join us at one of your professional organizations. Um, and then, you know, finally, uh, keep us honest. So if we're getting you what you need, say it if we're not say it and we'll keep trying to amend this and and make it beneficial for you um i do want to before i turn it over to henry thank an incredible team that comes together to put this put this on um andrew west and ashley miller and lauren luckett and all of the support team in eaa crystal villanueva um tamisha thompson rachel yates um they all work really hard to make sure that this is live running and um and the, and the video I mostly want to thank Kelly Dowd for her incredible work on the Global Drivers video that she did and all of the actors that, um, you know, quit their day job for, for an hour did to be interviewed. So um, thanks, everybody. We look forward to doing this again for you shortly. We're going to try to do it more than once a year on the virtual platform. Henry talked about increased engagement. I think Will's going to keep us honest on that. Um, and we already talked about a roundtable that we'll put together soon. So um, we won't. Be, we won't be too long before we see you again, but Henry, I'm gonna let you close us out. Um, Christy, thank you very much. I, I won't be too long because I know Angel wants to have his lunch. Uh, he wants to keep his healthy figure. Um, but I hope um, our many participants today found the program very interesting and informative. It certainly was informative for me. You know, OBO is such a large organization that it's always a learning experience just to understand the scope of what we're doing. And I think um, you were able to see just how expansive our portfolio is, how our impact is global. And I, I think you also had a chance, those who you know, participate in the various reviews, but those others seeing you know, just how those reviews and the other engagements, conversations we're having, just how much the IAG input and guidance means you know, to us and how it shapes our projects and the work that we do. Uh, and I think, you know, you get a sense too, just how multi-layered and significant the impact is of the work that we're doing globally and the impact that we have on so many different communities and, and how much we're doing to adapt, innovate, and understand future challenges, especially in relation to climate change. You know, as, as Christy was saying, I look forward to continued dynamic collaborations with the IAG in the coming year and really drawing on, on the expertise of all of you uh, because it's so extensive and so valuable for us to have that feedback. So in, in closing, I want to thank the IAG members again, our OBO leadership, our OBO team, the panelists and presenters. Um, but most importantly, I would really want to thank our external affairs director, Christy Fouché. Uh, as you can see, you know, she was really tireless in hurting us, us cats and um, overcoming our, our learned helplessness when it comes to technology. Uh, so this would not have been possible without her and without her you know, outstanding external affairs team, which she, you know, also had highlighted. So I really want to thank them. And again, um, I really enjoyed today's conversation. Thank you all very much for coming. And this concludes our annual IAG meeting. Thank you.